We are tonight's entertainment. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Excellent! Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Movie Mania Podcast, where we talk about films past, present and future. I am Bandit of Bandit Incorporated, and joining me is the man, the myth, the legend, he's with you till the end of the line! <laughs> oh, for <your> masculine <laughs> tears, it is Trilby slash Mr. Tardis. Hi Trilby. Uh, I'm just going to stare at you in silence for a little bit until the floor collapses underneath us. Because uh, that's yeah. the only appropriate response to that. I, I would save you from the water with my mechanical arm, but I don't have a mechanical arm, so I'm afraid you're just going to have to drown. So, uh, the future's not here yet. <laughs> Movies lied to me. <laughs> what are you doing, uh, Marvel? You lied to us. I hate this movie now. <laughs> uh, unsubscribed. <laughs> So how are you, Trilby? You've had a busy week, you were saying, just before? I have, yes. I've just started a new job uh, working on, I can't say what it is, super secret, top secret uh, BBC show uh, that I've got for about eight weeks. But it's good, fun work, really enjoying it. And once it's officially announced, I'll probably be able to say on the podcast. Uh, but uh, there's not much more I can say about it, but a lot of fun. And it's taken up a lot of my time. But there's also a lot of downtime when I'm just in an office with my laptop which means I can do a lot of writing as well. So it's like I'm working two jobs, which is fun. Yeah, I notice more, um, <laughs> notice more reviews coming up on your channel too. Mm, I, well, now that I've essentially finished my last job, which was start at 7 in the morning, end at 10 at night with no breaks, um, I've been able to catch up on some releases. This week I'm going to be seeing uh, Green Room, which is that Patrick Stewart horror thing. I'm going to be seeing that on Wednesday. And Thursday, I'm going to a midnight screening of Captain America Civil War and then going to work the next day after. So that's going to be fun. Wow. <laughs> but I'm, I'm committed to bringing you movie maniacs the best and most up-to-date content from across the pond. So what have you been up to, Vandit? Well, uh, now I've settled into my new house and uh, I'll, be Greece, working, I'll be working away. We're all moving to Greece. <laughs> Sorry, what? We're all moving to Greece. That's right. That was the plan. <laughs> Kings of Mykonos, yeah. <laughs> Shout out to that terrible Australian movie that nobody except me knows exists. Kings of Mykonos. Um, <laughs> there was... <laughs> yeah, so I moved into a new house and all that, and I'm still buzzing from the uh, from the return of Game of Thrones last night. I was up till like really late at night trying to get it finished so I could leave it uploading tonight, but I didn't quite get it all done. Ah. Mm. So I'll have to do that sometime today in between doing the podcast. So, <laughs> uh, And here's me just thinking, what's a Game of Thrones? <laughs> I've only watched o- only three the episodes. the coolest TV so. show of all time. Uh, I don't know. Doctor Who's better. they got a hip new companion who for the fifth time in a row is someone is a pretty woman in her 20s. Wow. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, to be <laughs> I've fair. Just done a, I've just done a video on that that's gone live a few hours ago so you can oh, find okay. all my thoughts there i even pitched my own companion idea in that video and everyone's like yeah bbc needs to hire you is is it a crossover with game of thrones uh no no no, Not no, watch game of thrones. <laughs> no i kidding. do mention amelia clark at one point but that's it yeah yeah <laughs> no uh, doctor who is great no doubt about that it, ca- it can be great it's not right now but i think it can be <laughs> cool shall we get yeah. into the movie news Movie news! Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. Cannonball! Well, here is the news, ladies and gentlemen, and Trilby is one who has it because I was still asleep, so... Mm. <laughs> but darn it, time zones. This is why we need to move to Greece and all be together. I know. And no, I, know. I won't, I won't so let the joke die. It. I just so want to get into the nice weather. Well, a, a so, lot happened this week. Actually, we got a lot of stuff. We got a lot of people dropping out of plans, and some people going back into them. We've got Marvel Studios dropping the Inhumans movie from its uh, from its release schedule. It was meant to be coming out on the twelfth of July, two thousand and nineteen, after both Infinity War movies. But it would seem that it has been taken off the slate. I'm assuming this is due to the split between. Uh, Kevin Feige and Ike Perlmutter, which happened a few months back, and it was Perlmutter who was really trying to champion the idea of the Inhumans and including them into Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and such. But I think now that that split has happened, 
we've lost the Inhumans, or at least it's been pushed back. I'm assuming it'll come back in a different form, just so that they don't annoy Vin Diesel. But when they've got <laughs> so much going on in the, in the coming years, I think that The Inhumans is a movie that we're not really going to miss or going to be sad about its delay. So yeah, what do you think, Bandit? Yeah. Well, it's, um, I guess it's, it's really unusual that Marvel actually cancels something or moves something back like that. Because they tend to just push ahead and make anything, no matter how wacky it might sound, like Guardians of the Galaxy. But, like, yeah, when I first heard this, my immediate thought was maybe it's because they want to make room for Spider Man because they made those plans before they got Spider Man back. Now they have to, mm. like, you're out of here, in humans. We're putting more Spider Man in. But hey, mm. look, I, I'm sure they'll do great no matter what they do. <laughs> but yeah, poor old Vin Diesel, because <laughs> he's been part of the reason he got Groot was because. Groot is like he's a voice without an acting like physical presence on the mm-hmm. set or like at least on screen and he was going to play uh what was the character's name Black Bolt Black Bolt that's right in uh, in humans who is a physical presence on screen but doesn't speak because his superpower is his powerful voice so no one would mm-hmm. recognize hey he's got the same voice as Groot <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so he's getting juggled around all over the place poor old Vin Diesel Mm. But it'll be okay with Guardians of the Galaxy 2, which I believe is coming to the end of filming, at least, or uh, towards the finish line, I think, if you follow James Gunn on, on Facebook and on Instagram. You need to follow James Gunn on Instagram if you don't already, people, because he actually posts some behind-the-scenes stuff and really crudely drawn storyboards and challenges people to guess what they're filming. <laughs> and some <laughs> of the stuff that the commenters come up with is just ridiculous but brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I should really be more active on Twitter. Uh, yeah, well, it's 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 not for everyone. I need to do more Twitter stuff as well, really. Well, I, I do follow Willie, William Shatner on Twitter. He's a joy to follow because he's oh, kind of yeah. like me in the comments of my YouTube videos. He's just constantly attacking everyone. <laughs> uh, you, you need to follow um, Dwayne The Rock Johnson on Instagram and on Facebook because it, it's yeah. just full of inspirational stuff and cheesy but wholly sincere stuff is really yeah. funny. He's a real funny guy. And he, it's basically where he breaks all of the latest Baywatch news. Like Pamela Anderson's going to be in Baywatch. That was announced on his Instagram. Um, and also that's actually a pretty good segue to the next story where Dwayne mm-hmm. The Rock Johnson is going to be starring in a Jumanji remake. We've known that the Jumanji remake has been happening for some time. Yeah. But it's official now. Um, there was news, a few rumors a few days ago saying that The Rock would be joining Kevin Hart for this remake uh, because they enjoyed working with each other so much on Central Intelligence, which which opens in a few months' time. Um, Kevin Hart's not been confirmed at the moment. It's just uh, Dwayne Johnson. But I think that he would do great in a supporting role. I don't see him leading a Jumanji movie if they are going for the original 90s movie which starred Robin Williams and was one of my favorite kids as, uh, mo- was one of my favorite movies as a kid. Mine too. Really enjoyed Jumanji. Mine too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very underrated one, I, at the time Jumanji, but I absolutely loved it. It was a big like uh one of the big cgi fest for families uh, when it came out and i remember yeah. just not being able to watch it when i was young because it was so it was so scary when the quicksand starts to come in the house and, and the, plant, the toxic the carnivorous plants. plant that tries to eat them yeah mm. it, it was a great mix of practical effects and cgi at the time and it's i think that robin williams is great in that role and i think maybe if they modernized it, it could be, for those of you who don't know about Jumanji, it starts with this kid getting sucked into a board game where he lives in the forest for like 20 years. And then he comes back out of the board game as Robin Williams as like a jungle man. And yeah. I'm thinking if he's they like modernized a, it, maybe he's like a man child mixed with Tarzan sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> that is basically if Robin Williams did George of the jungle and yeah. when it, and I think if they modernized it, they could have a kid get sucked into the board game and then he comes out as the rock be Which awesome. would be it would be awesome, and I think that's or maybe he, The Rock could play a modernized version of that um, Hunter character. I can't remember who played him. Um, he was after, yeah. He, I, I think he would do a, cool as um, like a modernized security sci-fi character. I'm not sure what um, inspiration to draw from, but that's what I'd kind of go with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's gonna be interesting because um, so you don't think The Rock can actually headline a movie like that? Oh, is he it... can. He he's proven to, but I think when it comes to Jumanji, if they're going to stick for the nostalgia factor, 
I think that he would do better in a supporting role. I think you need mm. somebody a bit more down to earth than The Rock because the last big movie he headlined was San Andreas, which was a movie Ooh. where he literally fought natural disasters. Yeah. That's not very down to earth. <laughs> if actually, you catch my drift. that's a good point. We all love The Rock, but he he doesn't actually star in many movies, does he? No, but he was in. But well, after the success of San Andreas, which I need to remind people, it was the biggest success for Warner Brothers last year. Nothing for Warner Brothers made money last year except for San Andreas, yeah. which is one reason why they've had so many problems with their slate um, after Batman v Superman. It's not just them; it's it's the fact that Mad Max was a critical hit but didn't make much money, and then there was Pan, Jupiter Ascending, and all of these movies that just were massive bombs for them. So that's why The Rock is such a big star, because he was basically head, he was the tentpole holding up Warner Brothers last year, which is why they were so quick to greenlight San Andreas 2. Oh, oh no. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's the thing. San Andreas 2. They are. I guess it's the How Transformer they- effect. You know? <laughs> uh, how many more earthquakes can the rock punch? Maybe he'll fight a tidal wave in the next one. <laughs> Maybe the, oh, or it volcano, comes out of the board or a game. Comet. No, that's been. <laughs> <laughs> he just punches a comet. Oh, that's brilliant! A bushfire. But... You know, he'll fight that. <laughs> <laughs> but are, are you looking forward to a Jumanji remake? You said you liked the films like, uh, when you were young, but uh, do you, would you want to see another one, a remake? Strangely enough, yes, yes, I would. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> which is which is weird because not only has it got the nostalgia factor of a movie I liked as a kid, it's also got that your well, I mean, honest trailers made a joke about um, you can never recast any of Robin Williams' roles now because who are you going to put in the role that he had that's going to match him? Hmm. But so they're, they're they're doing the nostalgia thing and they're doing the remake uh, recasting Robin Williams. But strangely, I'm still interested. I don't know. I just mm. think that's a, a really good premise and a lot of new stuff they could do with it. And it's kind of an okay excuse for bad CGI because the animals mm-hmm. that come out of the board game are not supposed to be real animals. So it's okay if they don't look quite right. Mm. That was at least the excuse I have for the CGI in the first one. <laughs> that, that and it was the 90s. And it was the 90s, yeah. So it wasn't up to date at the time. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, let- um, back to the news, we've got another story with um, Deadpool 2 is officially a go. Yes. Uh, Ryan Reynolds is coming back, of course, and Tim Miller, the director, he made his directorial debut with Deadpool, mm-hmm. and he's going to be returning to do the sequel. And when you make a movie that's as, so, it's just such a huge financial success, the biggest R-rated movie of all time, of course you are going to get sequels. We have no date, although 20th Century Fox did announce a couple of dates over the next few years, presumably one of which will be Deadpool, but we don't have official confirmation on that. I'm assuming they'll want to get this out as quickly as possible, probably get out by summer of next year, and I think Deadpool 2 is going to be one of the big films to look out for. It's going to have a lot more hype than the first one did, and the first one There was a lot of hype for that. So you excited for Deadpool 2? Absolutely, mate. I'm so excited for Deadpool 2. It's like, um, that. I think Deadpool made like, I can't remember how much money it made, but it made sort of like Iron Man level monies, which is also Batman v Mm. Superman level money. It made 760 million. Is that like total or? Um, Total. It's still got a little bit more, but it's not going to, it's not going to, um, get much higher on a budget of it made like seventy seven hundred million dollars more than its production budget. Production budget, yeah, yeah. which is phenomenal profit margins. Cool. All right. Yeah, because those those three hundred million I know were just in America, so I'm not sure worldwide. But point is, <laughs> who would have thought? <laughs> who would have yeah. thought it was possible? But I guess it 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 is kind of similar to Iron Man in that way. If you just get the right person for the right role. And at least in Deadpool's case, you stay true to the character. Iron Man, they changed mm-hmm. a lot of changed a lot of stuff. But um, yeah, it's like see, everyone's talking about like comic book formulas and trying to follow a formula that works. I think Deadpool is a formula. I want to see more uh, comic book movies follow. What do you reckon? Mm. Well, I think why Deadpool was such a success was not just the marketing and just how brilliant Ryan Reynolds was at shepherding this movie. It was the fact it was honest with itself. It knew what yeah. it wanted to be. It was modestly budgeted. It, like, it's a 58 to $60 million movie. 
So it, it kind of proved that you can make these mid-tier movies and they can give you blockbuster numbers. You don't need to spend like half a billion dollars on Batman v Superman to get like small but notable profits. You can make these smaller films and make them big. That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Because in, in the UK, I've been doing the box office uh, UK roundup over the past few weeks. And uh, while Batman v Superman is had the biggest opening weekend in the UK for a superhero movie. It's had really, really steep um, drop-offs over the next few weeks, and it might not even match the total that Deadpool made in the UK. It might not make more money than Deadpool, which is mm. insane, because it costs like five to six times more than Deadpool did. Wow. wow. I, I, I remember people were joking, saying, if Batman v Superman doesn't make the same... If, if Batman makes less in its opening weekend than Deadpool the industry is going to take notice. And while it didn't do that, it's still close enough that it's got to sting for some big budget um, productions in the near future. It's probably why Gambit is now basically down the drain because they were talking a $200 million Gambit movie. You don't need that big of a budget for Gambit. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's interesting Uh, that you bring that up because I wasn't going to bring this up. I put this out on my Twitter, but since you brought... It up and it relates. Um, recently, there was an <laughs> article on uh, Cinema, Cinema Blend, I think it was, which was basically mm. saying, you know, Batman v Superman is on track because it made domestically, not internationally, roughly the same amount that Iron Man made domestically. And Iron Man was the start of the Marvel Universe. Batman v Superman is the start of the DC Universe. So everything's totally on track. And oh, I thought, what so a pandering. wonderful bit of spin work there. There's more than a few problems with that considering that batman v superman cost as you said so much more than iron mm-hmm. man would have made iron man was a character that nobody know, knew or cared about and everyone cared about mm-hmm. him by the end of it batman v superman are characters that everybody in the world loves and yet you still struggle to make your own money back yeah there's way mm-hmm. to and are we just forgetting that man of steel was supposed to be at the start of the universe and before that green lamp was supposed to be the start of the universe yeah they keep changing their story to try to justify what's going on Warner brothers the, how about you just make a good movie how about that the, if you just delusion. take all the effort you're putting into justifying your mistakes and instead just fix your mistakes how about that what a novel uh, well, idea but, but what <sighs> was it cinema blend who did that story yeah, I know they're not uh, totally but what, what, they, what they essentially did was they said, here's a bag of apples, here's a bag of oranges. They're the same. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no! <laughs> Stupid! The delusion is real. And it's really frustrating. I mean, I'm a defender of Man of Steel uh, to a certain extent, but apparently that means that I'm a... Uh, I'm a DC hater, which is strange. And it's funny because you say, oh, you must be a DC hater. Oh, okay, well, did you like Green Lantern? No, nobody liked Green Lantern. Then you're a DC hater. <laughs> the argument is so flimsy. Yeah. I Look, uh, and for, for all our listeners who are sick of us banging on Batman v Superman, I wasn't going to bring this up, but it just came up naturally in the flow of the conversation, <laughs> okay? And, like, uh, we're bringing it up because... Nobody nobody wants these movies to suck. Nobody wants no. these movies to suck. It's because it bothers us that it, it wasn't what we were hoping for. That's why mm. we bring it up. But I have noticed as well, like, about the YouTuber sphere, <laughs> oh, there's a, been a couple of videos of people saying, you know, all this can, the conspiracy theory against DC being debunked. Because, <laughs> uh. you know, a lot of people are like, no, no, it's just there's been this massive conspiracy to hate on this movie and that's why nobody likes it. And people are like, no, it's it's just it's not not that good. <laughs> nah. And then people say, oh, after Batman v Superman, it's it because it's proof that critics hate comic book movies despite Deadpool opening a month or two prior yeah. and being loved by critics. Or people like, no, no, see Batman v Superman it's targeted at a, an older, more mature audience and there's no market for that with comic books. Well Deadpool you know, mm-hmm. that's an adult yeah. audience. It's I was, uh, yeah, Deadpool came out at the perfect time to debunk most of these things. Yeah, and I, I love it for it. And hopefully, Deadpool two will somehow be able to recapture that lightning. Yeah, and I, I think that would be terrific. It, it just goes to show, like like Iron Man did. What matters is just make a good story. Just make a good mm-hmm. story with good characters, and we don't care if it's a comic book guy we've never heard of before we don't care if you spend like a stack of money on it or less money on it just make a good story that's all people really care about yeah exactly if you make it they will come yeah but (laughs) so with deb so with tim miller and ryan reynolds coming back for deadpool 2 
we have some people who are not coming back for future sequels. We have Amelia Clark who is promoting this upcoming uh, romantic comedy called Me Before You. And on the tour, on the promotional tour, she was asked about Terminator Genesis or Ginny Smith or whatever you want to call it. it it's yeah. pronounced, it, it's spelt Genesis, but it's either way. Um, and when asked what <laughs> she would be doing about um, the future of Sarah Connor and the character, um, she, she was asked, are you going to be in future movies? And she said, no. Can I say that? It's okay? No, yeah. no. Yeah, yeah. she was very she was very candid about it all. I'm, so I'm surprised seemed... they brought it up because I thought it already be confirmed that there wasn't going to be any more Terminator movies. I think that the, like Arnold says everywhere he goes that they're making new Terminator movies, but in terms of whether or not the cast would be coming back, this is the official announcement uh, from Amelia Clark that at least she is not coming back as Sarah Connor if Sarah Connor is going to be in the sequels at all. You know what? This sounds like bad news, but for me this is actually good news because it means a sequel is still a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Oh, you. Uh, so who, who would there you cast out? There is no fate, with? but what we make for <laughs> ourselves in your face. <laughs> People so who would... like this movie. <laughs> Out of interest, who would you cast as as, as a, a replacement to Amelia Clark for Sarah Connor? Who would you cast? Let's say hypothetically, mm. we're going for the same age range. Oh, good question. I hadn't thought about that. Do you want, do you want me to give you a moment yeah. to think about it? Yeah, yeah, give me a moment but, to think about it. Okay, but for Amelia Clark, like, there's a lot of things wrong with Terminator Genesis. I, I didn't hate it. I think I gave it two out of five stars. Uh, I think there were some appealing things about it, and everything that was wrong with that movie. Amelia Clark wasn't one of those things. She wasn't like Jai Courtney, where the casting was kind of fundamentally wrong, um, and she wasn't phenomenally charming at points like Arnold Schwarzenegger could be. She was sort of in the middle. She did the role. Uh, she got presumably a big paycheck for it, which allows her to do some smaller, more interesting things. And then she's left the franchise before she gets bogged down in something that is, at least from public perception, is kind of sinking. Yeah. I, who knows? We may get another one if if they base it around China and they lower the budget a little bit. Yeah. Um, but it would seem that Amelia Clark is not coming back. Hmm. Mm. Well. Um, well, to answer your question now, I have time to think. Who who I would recast as Sarah Connor if they do make a sequel? Because we know Arnie will come back and Jai Courtney will obviously do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you would have you would have to hold them down and, and if to stop them coming back and if they're still going ahead with the Zack Snyder Justice League when Batman v Superman hasn't actually made a profit yet and Terminator Anything's Genesis possible. has made a profit it makes sense to me you know but um mm-hmm. no I'd pick if they were going to recast it I'd go with either two options number one I'd cast the chick who played Feora in Man of Steel because she was so good in that role and I really want to see that actress in more things and I think yes, she, she's very cool. she'd certainly be good. Or I'd go with sort of a little bit outside the box, take an acting risk, but at this point, who would care with the Terminator Genesis sequel? But mm-hmm. also with a bit of a gimmicky name, which might bring in an extra crowd, and I'd go Ronda Rousey. Ooh, okay. So I'm just thinking, you, you see Ronda Rousey, <laughs> and, she's not, and she's not just like the sort of meek... Uh, Sarah Connor that we meet in the first Terminator nor is she the badass Linda Hamilton from the second one she looks like she would knock out the Terminators in one kick wouldn't you like (laughs) to see her do an arm bar on a T T-800 and just break the robot's arm like she does in the MMA fights it's not a fair it's not a fair fight for the Terminator (laughs) (laughs) who needs Arnold when you've got Ronda Rousey as Sarah Connor the machines don't stand a chance Ronda Rousey Uh, everyone loves Ronda Rousey I'd like to see that as like maybe a Saturday Night Live skit or a, or like a jokey trailer skit or something. I think that would be see worth I mean? seeing. It's, it's Just... got you interested now. <laughs> it has. That it might has. actually work. You combine her with a more China focused thing, and you know maybe mm-hmm. polish up some of the problems in the story. You could still make money off that. I know people like Trey would hate it and be like, "No, just let it die." But for me, Terminator died a long time anyway, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah, I think you. I've said this before, you need to go small again with this franchise. You you can't really top um, action-wise what you did in Terminator 2 or maybe even Terminator 3. You've got to go smaller back to the, maybe not indie route, but like budget it like Deadpool. Like maybe give it a 50 to $60 million budget and make it smaller. And I think that way you would at least give a bit more spirit to the franchise, I think. Yeah. Or even like, yeah, if they don't want to focus, like if they can't spend more money on big action stuff... Maybe they could get just like a weird, wacky sort of writer like 
maybe the guy did Looper to come up with some cool sort of time travel scenario that they can play out in the movie or something like that. Mm. It could still I'm be thinking... salvaged. I still believe it could be salvaged. Thank you, Trilby. You've given yeah, me hope. I think you could get someone like David Robert Mitchell who directed It Follows. Ooh. I think that maybe if he, if, if he doesn't write it, because I think It Follows, well directed, but writing wise, it contradicts itself like at almost every single <laughs> opportunity. So People uh, still uh, enjoyed it, it though, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, they still enjoyed it, but I, I, I didn't quite. See. It was too broken from a script level for me. I yeah. think if if he writes it, uh, it's, it's hire a proofreader. Yep. One, I'll proofread it for free. <laughs> That's my offer to you, uh, Terminator right. Genesis sequel. I'll proofread it for free. Just give me a credit and a cheese sandwich or something. But because he was <laughs> able to, um, through his direction, engineer a sense of paranoia that that you were being followed by this unstoppable force. Yeah. Very much like the first Terminator movie. Yeah. Yeah. So, that could work. That could work, I'm yeah. telling you. Yeah. Yeah, that might have could work because it was my idea. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm I with can. you. I'm with you, Trilby. There you go. <laughs> uh, but I, this I is do what think happens ter- when Trey isn't here. We manage to turn a bad story about Terminator Genesis into a good story. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, and remember, bear in mind, I never only gave it Trey two stars here. out of I only gave it two stars out of five, so I liked bits of it. Like, I didn't think yeah. it was an outright failure. So yeah, like yeah, was, I, I am cool. middle man. Like the future war stuff was good. The Arnie mm-hmm. versus Arnie fight was good. Him melting the T one thousand in acid bit that was good. That was cool. Yeah, there was there was good bits. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, and speaking of, I don't know how to transition this Power Rangers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we've got our first look this week at Elizabeth Banks as Rita Repulsa, the villain in the upcoming Power Rangers reboot, and she looks basically exactly what, what you'd want from like a, a homage to the 90s series. I think she looks really pretty cool in this costume. Yeah. Well, well, have you seen it? Uh, well, no, but I never saw Power Rangers either, because I was term, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles generation, so by the time Power Rangers came along, I was a little bit too old, so I sort of missed the boat on that. Were, were uh, you like a Power Rangers kid, or? Um, I watched the first like two or three seasons, and then once it got to, because it's still going on, Power Rangers. They have oh, like yeah. different incarnations, like every year. Uh, what, what, what are they on now? They are on. Um, just I'm on the Wikipedia page now because that is clearly how I do all of my research. Uh, <laughs> uh, they are <laughs> on um, Dino Charge and Dino Supercharge. According to Wikipedia, that's Sounds actually what they cool. Yeah, yeah Dino <laughs> Supercharge. Now, I was there um, watching the original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, which I believe this new reboot is going to be taking most of its inspiration from because you got to get that nostalgia dollar. Um, yep. They started filming this week and they have got a few photos of Eliz- Elizabeth Banks on location in the costume, but this official one that they've um, revealed in People magazine. Um, an official production photo looks a lot cooler. It looks um, better once it's been enhanced digitally and on, on all of the detail and everything. I think it looks pretty cool. And I think Elizabeth Banks is um, is a legitimate talent who could do a great job at playing this really big, over-the-top, shrieking villain. Like uh, if, you, if you know the um, Power Rangers theme song, it opens with Rita going, Yeah! After 10,000 years, I'm free! It yeah. opens like that. <laughs> And I think Elizabeth Banks is the perfect person to do something like that. I, I don't. Yeah. I think this this works. Whether or not the movie around her is going to work, that's up in the air. But we're going to find out in, um, I believe it's March 2017. Okay. Uh, so yeah. you don't have much to say because you're not a Power Rangers person, I'm assuming. No, dude. Like, it all sounds good to me. Yeah. My my nephew will probably enjoy it. I'll, I'll take him yeah. to see it. <laughs> I, th- I think if it's a cross be- between, say, um, Pacific Rim and um, God, what is it that teenagers like nowadays? Um, Minecraft, the Hunger Games. According to my nephew, <laughs> if they yeah, make a Minecraft a... movie, he'll see that five hundred times. Yeah, if it's, it's like... a cross between Pacific Rim and Minecraft, because all the kids are into Minecraft, yep. then we've got <laughs> <laughs> then we've got a winning formula. Clearly, that's how Hollywood works. Like yeah. Minecraft mixed with just throw another dart at the dartboard. Power Rangers. You know they <laughs> will go. make a Minecraft movie at some point, and the best part oh. is, once they make the Minecraft movie, people will be able to create those scenes exactly in the Minecraft game, 
and reenact them scene for scene. <laughs> People will oh, probably yeah. remake the entire movie in <laughs> Minecraft Game <laughs> Yeah, like I think somebody has recreated scenes from the Lego movie with actual Lego in stop motion. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think that a Minecraft movie has been announced, but nobody's been attached to it. There's been no release date. It's basically just saying, yeah, we're doing it, and that's yeah. it. So Angry it, it could Birds go the way of Inhumans. Angry Birds, yes. Oh, that looks funny, uh, doesn't it? <laughs> it looks okay. It does look okay. Just I, okay? Like, you, didn't, you didn't like the bit where the eagle pees in the water and they're like... Ooh. Um, no, not really. But um, really? I oh, think okay. Maybe there, it's... there are some bits I do like. Like I, I, I do like the scene where the little bird is kicking the football at Red's house, and you think he's going to kick the ball, but instead he kicks the kid. I think that that's a <laughs> that's right. genuinely clever subversion. Yeah. Um, although um, watching the trailers, everything revolving around like Josh Gad's character, that the yellow bird, just seems really forced. But I, I think. In terms of Angry Bird movies, it looks about as good as it could be. But it's coming from Sony, who basically don't do good work in their animation department unless they're doing CGI on stuff like Goosebumps, which, by the way, just got announced for a sequel like two hours ago. Go- Goosebumps 2 is happening. Okay, um, yeah. So, but I, I think that... See, it's Sony, and Sony make products. They don't make movies. Mm, so that's true. That's true. That's really the the short. That's just the short story, really. But yeah, uh, any more to say about Power Rangers? Um, no, not really. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on to to another piece of '90s nostalgia. Uh, there's apparently a Pokemon movie happening, but just who is going to make it is up in the air at the moment because there's apparently a massive bidding war happening between Warner Brothers, Sony, and Legendary Pictures to try and get their hands on the property to make a movie based on the Pokemon franchise. Wow. And it'll be interesting if Legendary Pictures gets a hold of it because that is a Chinese company now after their division a couple of years ago. Um, and that would mean that a Chinese company is making a Japanese adaptation. And because China and Japan don't really have a great relationship with each other, basically, if the Pokemon movie is bought by Legendary, World War Three, baby! <laughs> Um, <laughs> not to make you paranoid, um, but I'd, I'd like to see. Um, that's right. Warner that's Brothers. the act of war between China and Japan. Never mind the Chinese building floating islands in the South China Sea to try to bag up more territory. This is where yeah. it's at. Yeah, but it was, they're trying to get Pokemon. Knew, we always knew it would be that electric rat who would kill us all. <laughs> uh, Damn I'd you, Pokemon! <laughs> like I said, like, uh, um, I think that Sony make products instead of movies, so if they did get a hold of this, I think the end, the end result would just be like a Smurfs-type I'm, train wreck. I'm, I'm sorry, my mind's just sort of flown off into this parallel dimension now where Pokemon somehow brings about like nuclear holocaust and we're in this Mad Max future and like people find some Pokemon cards and they're like, <gasps> it is the evil one, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he has the shiny Charizard! <laughs> Someone needs to write fan fiction of this. <laughs> Everyone's like mutated from the radiation. Oh, the dark one has returned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Please continue. No, me. <laughs> th- th- yeah, everyone's going to end up looking like um, like Garbodor. Which, if you Google Garbodor from Pokemon, he's essentially the trash bag Pokemon. <laughs> he is literally a trash bag who is a Pokemon. <laughs> Everyone would look like that in the future. Oh. Uh, yeah. But anyway, yeah, I think um, Sony would make a product as opposed to an actual fun movie. I'd like to see um, Warner Brothers get their hands on this property instead of Legendary because, you know, I don't want the world to end. Um, <laughs> but I- I'd be interested in seeing like a maybe a, a 3D animated film or a live action um, cartoon hybrid in a sense. Because um, I think that this property, while, yeah, it's, it's aimed at kids, has great potential uh, to really just give... A- younger audiences a sense of wonder and imagination to show this futuristic world where we have limitless marketing possibilities yeah <laughs> absolutely mm. wow it's it's certainly you... like those those last like three stories or so have all been about like remaking either toy brands or like young uh kids tv shows or mm-hmm. yeah it's the age of remaking nostalgia that's what it is <laughs> See, I'm wondering, like, because they, they've remade The Jungle Book, which was a very good movie. We talked about it last week. Yeah. But um, what are they going to... Are they just going to remake it again in 40 years' time? 
Like, <laughs> like mm. I'm just thinking, what do you remake in 40, 50 years time once this cycle starts again? Do you remake the remake? So, cause where's, or do you get like a remake of Pacific Rim or something? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess, yeah, in, I, think... I guess in 20 years time, will they be rebooting and restarting like the Deadpool franchise again? Oh, maybe. I mean, Spider-Man's gone through, what, three iterations in the past 15 years? Yeah. Uh, Who could play by, Deadpool by... in 20 years? Let's speculate. No, let's not. <laughs> um, Asa Butterfield. Um, well, no. Someone oh, who's I... not born yet. <laughs> Someone who's you not born. You out there born... listening to the podcast, it could be you. <laughs> yeah, y- yes, you, that glimmer in Hugh Jackman's eye. You are the next Deadpool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually do have, um, actually do have one bit of news I want to throw in here at the end because I'd like to get your opinion on if we have time. Do we have time? Um, well, I guess what I just wanted to ask: Have you seen any Pokemon movies at all, or do, do you care about this story at all? Nope, never played it before either. <laughs> Fair enough. Pokemon Maybe that's why my mind actually... diverted off into like Mad Max territory again. Oh, with the Pokemon, got, it's probably fans. probably more interesting. But Pokemon <laughs> Three is a legitimately good movie and i'm not i'm not just saying that from nostalgia it is actually pretty good there are a lot of duds though because they make an animated pokemon film every year there's like 15 movies um so yeah yeah, you've got a lot of homework to catch up on no doubt it's got a lot of fan base and yeah obviously a very entertaining thing yeah just like with power rangers i just kind of missed the boat i feel like is all yeah but clearly we'll all become garbador garbage bag pokemon freaks and a mad max universe in a few years time if legendary get their hands on this property so i hereby welcome our our uh, garbador overlords (laughs) as do i I. to (laughs) to garbador cheers so i want to ask you because uh this is a bit of old this is a bit of old news but i want to bring it up last week but i forgot um i don't know if you noticed but there's a, a trailer for a movie coming out called birth of a nation have you seen this? Mm. Yeah. I have, yeah. I was actually thinking of bringing it up, but um, we don't um, normally talk about some of the smaller Sundance films on the podcast. So, but yeah, Birth of a Nation. Well, it's it's um, yeah, it's interesting to get a movie sort of based around. For anyone who hasn't seen the trailer, it's sort of based around historical events of uh, a slave revolt in the South during the time of slavery, and it's weird to get a movie about slavery when it's not Oscar season. Because it's mm. like that's when you get the slavery movies, the Holocaust movies, or the movies about how great actors are. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. those are yeah. all the ones that you win the Oscars with. So it's weird for it to come out here. But um, what's interesting, and what I want to ask you about, Trey, is uh, this movie is called Birth of a Nation. Mm-hmm. And Birth of a Nation was also the name of a movie that was made by the Ku Klux Klan, <laughs> an infamous yeah. movie way, way back in the day. And. So, like, this movie is obviously trying to reclaim sort of that title. Mm-hmm. And it was very interesting scrolling through YouTube to see that title for a movie trailer, Birth of a Nation, and it's got a bunch of black guys, like, running at the camera with, like, swords and axes and stuff. And I was like, yeah, ah, it was very strange. Yeah. Do you, think you, you look poss- at that thumbnail and you think that um, you, you're going to get an ending shot like Civil War. You've got the yeah. slaves running towards r- from right to end left. It like Civil War, doesn't it? And you've got the Ku Klux Klan <laughs> running from left to right. <laughs> and then Spider-Man comes in and saves him. Yeah. Webs people's hands together. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah. hi. <laughs> and then it's Jonah Hill underneath the hood, like in Django Unchained. <laughs> we have fun here. It's all connected. <laughs> <laughs> but do you, here's my question. Do you think it's possible to sort of reclaim a title like that? I think I think you can, because mm. Birth of a Nation is mainly it, the original one from uh, 1915, 1916. It's one of those films that you're made to watch in film school because it is a really? it's a silent basically it's a three hour silent film, um, which obviously is made by the Ku Klux Klan, but it was a huge film. It was a landmark in film production. It pioneered many editing effects, and it's it is a very very great production. It's just one of those things that you have gotta really forget about <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's something that um. Obviously, you don't agree with its message, but you've got to admire its production, very much like Man of Steel, where collateral damage is okay, um, but it looks really cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. right. It's Man of Steel like, is the new KKK like movie. So I guess Not in really. film school, that's a bit like if you're studying political science, you have to read Mein Kampf. But, you know, yeah, same like yeah, with Birth of a Nation, it's not that you agree with it, it's just to understand, you know, where it comes from and all that sort of stuff, yeah. Mm. But, but outside of that film school environment... 
not nobody has really seen Birth of a Nation. Nobody watches it. It's not really shown on syndication on TV anymore. It's you're not going to find it on Netflix in the what's trending section. It's it's one of those films where you watch. Uh, film students watch it to admire the production to learn about the history of filmmaking and that's really the only audience it has nowadays so i think it's it's not going to be a big narrative where this new birth of a nation directed by nate parker is going to be claiming the title back it's just going to be using it ironically as maybe um a winking nod to that audience who know about the title and know its significance and it's just going to be called birth of a nation to anybody else yeah, but yeah. it's it's an interesting way to sort of take that title and to twist it in a very ironic way. I think that um, it's very clever, and this is it comes out in October in America, so it is it is positioning itself for Oscar con- uh, consideration, and it won the oh, top it prizes is. at Sundance. Okay, so that's why you're great on the podcast. You actually have facts. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs facts when you have passion? <laughs> that's right. But yeah, it, it won the top prizes, and Nate Parker is—he's going to be walking away from the Oscars with at least like a few nominations. He's—he directed it, he wrote the screenplay, he's starring in it, so he's made at least one nomination in one of those categories. Mm. Um, and it's obviously it's going to be one of those. It could be a twelve-year a slave, uh, twelve years a slave scenario where it uh, it may get nominations just based on the subject matter alone. Like Twelve Years a Slave, it's a yeah. really good and powerful movie, but I don't think it, I think it was one of the weakest nominees that year. Didn't um, didn't some of the some of the people who voted said that they actually voted for that even though they hadn't seen it? <laughs> yes, that was a thing. They said, "Yeah, it feels like the type of movie we should vote for, so we'll vote we'll vote for it." Yeah, I, yeah. and I hope that Birth of a Nation, regardless of its overall quality, doesn't get a pity nomination or a pity win after right. the whole Oscar So White thing last year, um, because I think that um, it would be it would do a disservice to the movie. And I'm sure that Nate Parker, who directed and wrote the movie, doesn't want a pity win. He wants an earnest win, as any good filmmaker should. Mm. But it's 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 way too early to be talking about Oscar stuff because every year it's it we have these big front runners like uh, the Danish Girl and Steve Jobs and these big awards movies at the beginning of the year and then at the end like they don't get any they don't get ahead they don't they don't get any headway movies like Spotlight which come right the hell out of nowhere are the ones that end up ultimately winning it it happens almost every year but everyone's still determined to predict the front runners a year in advance. Mm. Well, I've, yeah. I was actually as you were saying that I was thinking like. Going back to the title, Birth of a Nation, though, I think, because uh, obviously this is based around real events of this uh, slave revolt, mm. so I don't, I don't know the story too well, but, but if in some way they tied this slave revolt into the beginning of the Civil War, then the title, Birth of a Nation, would make sense, because Civil War was actually the birth of a new nation, in a sense. Mm. So if they somehow connect it to the Civil War, then it'd be more than just a wink to the old one, it'd also fit the story. So it'd be interesting to see. I look forward to it. I, I don't know what what exactly the aftermath of um, the of um, Nat Turner's rebellion was. It was when he um, he was uh, when he was young. He was taught to read so that he could study the Bible and be a preacher to slaves on the plantation. He was like more mm. or less raised just to do that. And then he goes on tour and he's exploited so that his slave owners can make a profit from him doing these sermons and these inspirational speeches. Um, and then he decides to change course and take fate into his own hands and become a, a a big rebel. He he led dozens and dozens of slaves to one of the biggest um, uprisings of the 19th century where they killed dozens of people. Um, mm. It's not going to be a, a fun watch. <laughs> this isn't going to be like this the other civil war that everybody's really looking forward to and going to have a really good time. Um, it's, it's not going to be anything like that at all. Um, but I am expect a very powerful movie if it is as good as we've been hearing it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to mm. know something funny? <laughs> oh, please, let, make me laugh again. <laughs> I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll say this quick because we've got we to gotta move on, but... Also, when I was a kid, like in Australia, he learning Australian history. Um, our history teacher, as he was teaching us all about, you know, Australia was a settlement for British convicts and the British convicts that were brought over here. And the way he's like explaining it to us is he's like, you know, these people on the other side of the world, they're, they're torn away from their homes. They're taken in chains, in shackles in these boats across 
horrible waters where people just drown or die of starvation or die of exposure. And then when they get to this land, they're like forced to work. It's like forced labor in the fields. And if they if they protest, they meet the business end of a whip. And if they protest too much, they get lynched from a tree. And we're like, is is he talking about us or... <laughs> So like, is he talking about Australian convicts or someone else? And he's like, so he's telling this story and he's like, and then when it's all over, the British still need a colonist. So they're like, hey, you can have that land over there. And they're like, woo, this is better than England. So it's a happy ending. So there you go. (laughs) Slavery, it has a happy ending. (laughs) Oh, gosh. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Right. Okay, let's... Let's let's go to some light affair. Um, we've been doing sure. the news for a little bit, so I'm just thinking uh, lightning round. I'll just name off some trailers that dropped this past year, and we'll give very very quick thoughts. Are you ready, okay. Bandit? I am ready. Okay, Independence Day Resurgence. What do you think? Uh, the second trailer. Haven't seen it yet. Good talk. Um, the Magnificent <laughs> Seven. Um, actually, I'm really looking forward to that because I enjoyed the original. Uh, well, I enjoyed mm. the. Magnificent Seven and also The Seven Samurai, the Japanese Japanese movie that was the original that it was based off. Mm-hmm. So I'm really looking forward to seeing another one. Yeah. How about yeah. you? This, look, this looked like a really good remake of A Bug's Life. <laughs> it is which is an animated story. version of The Seven Samurai. Oh, wow. This story's been retold so many times. Okay. <laughs> it's just like um, Lion King is Hamlet. Oh, uh, right. Yes. Yes, it yeah, is. Blowing your mind today. Um, wow. Okay, girl on, you and girl all on your a track. Facts, man, you <laughs> <laughs> bring facts here, mix, mixing things up. We've got girl on a train. Um, haven't seen it. Have you seen it? What's it about? Okay. Um, it's about. Um, it's based off a best-selling book from last year. It was a huge hit in the UK, at least. And it's about um, a woman on a train. Uh, it's her daily commute to work, and she sees some. She sees like a murder or a disappearance. I've not read the book. I'm told it's brilliant, but the book is like very London-centric. It is like full of ver- of British ideals, and it's got like British references and everything. So, of course, this is an American remake. Of course, it's set in America, and it's clearly aping Gone Girl. <laughs> uh, the, f- the film could be good, but it, it like it, yeah, it's just frustrating that a British source material is just being colonized by America, f- filthy yanks. Um, yeah, just just like how the British colonized every other country and sent my people in chains to Australia to work as slaves. Moving on, <laughs> <laughs> Jason. Bourne. I'm just trying to make you feel bad because you're throwing all these facts at me. <laughs> oh, the shame! I've got to nominate this movie now because I feel bad. I've got to. Yeah, I, I want to see the that. Oscar bait Australian convict movie. That's what I want to see. <laughs> uh, you'd call it. You'd call it um, going down under. <laughs> or British and the the Brits are dingoes or something. Yeah, you could get I don't Hugh know. Jackman playing the main character and Russell Crowe playing the guard. And oh, they've already done that. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's Lego's get Matt. Well. Let's get Matt Damon in there. But is he good in Jason Bourne? What do you think? Oh yeah, I'm. I'm actually kind of weirdly looking forward to this. It could just be I'm happy that Hawkeye's Jason Bourne spinoff series is officially dead now. But I'm looking forward to this. How about you? Um, the Bourne franchise has done nothing for me. Um, <laughs> it, really? I, they're not bad films. It's just I was never engaged from the beginning. I don't think they're particularly good. And I think when it comes to this trailer where they're trying to show um, Matt Damon's a badass, yeah. Matt Damon the badass is always like the weakest aspect of his performance. He's not the badass guy. He's the more down-to-earth, quirky, witty guy. That's I think true. that's what he excels yeah. at. Um, but it doesn't look. That's that's his it's... yeah. That's his proper territory there, like in the Martian. Mm. Yeah, he, using his botany powers to to save himself on Mars. That's what he's. That's, that's right. what he's best I, at. I want to see Jason Bourne doing more botany. That's what he mm. needs to be doing. <laughs> exactly. He just needs to have his own like greenhouse show. <laughs> just planting stuff, planting poop potatoes day in day out. That's oh, right. speaking of poop poop potatoes, um, there was some news about the Golden Globes. They're going to be um. Re- um uh, adjusting their rules so that uh, obviously dra- dramatic films don't get nominated for best comedy. So hopefully we won't have The Martian winning best comedy <laughs> in future. <laughs> That's probably uh, good. Yeah, <laughs> there's been some strange yeah. overlaps in that uh, that category as of the past, isn't it? 
Yeah, that, that was weird. But um, this trailer, it looks okay. I like the um, shots of the van just plowing its way through cars, but that's really the only thing that really made me like perk up and, and notice anything in this trailer. It didn't really do anything for me. And last, but most certainly not least, is X-Men Apocalypse, the final trailer. Have you seen it? It only dropped a few hours ago. Um, I haven't bothered to watch it yet. What's it like? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a really good trailer, a uh, lot more action, a lot more money shots. Um, and we get a surprise cameo at the very, very end, which if you're on the internet, you probably won't be able to avoid uh, like knowing about it. But if you are able to, uh, if you've made up your mind and you're definitely going to go see X-Men Apocalypse opening weekend, then you may want to avoid this trailer because it does tease a big cameo. Um, it, it does tease a big cameo. So, okay. yeah, it, it's it's not quite Spider-Man at the end of Civil War. But it is a pretty cool moment that you may have wanted to see for the very first time in a movie theater. Wow. But it's a real good trailer. Well, I'm going to have to go watch it when we're done. It's, you got me interested now. Well done. <laughs> oh, that was the opposite of what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> the trailer sucks. You're like, it's kind play. of sort of okay. And I'm like, oh, sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's a good trailer. I just don't like the emphasis that they keep on placing on Jennifer Lawrence's mystique because she's clearly only here for the paycheck and is very bored in this role. Hey, I, I don't care, man. As long as she's there, I'm happy as a clown. <laughs> as long as she's there and naked and blue. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that is all of the news. And that is all of the trailers. This was like trailer palooza week. So a lot, a lot of stuff to watch. It certainly was. And now, our feature presentation. So, here's our feature presentation for Captain America, The Winter Soldier. What we're going to do is, even though everybody's seen it at this point, um, just in case some haven't, we'll just very briefly sort of give our thoughts on it in a non-spoiler section, and then we'll just jump into spoilers. So, Trilby, overall, um, what are your like general overall thoughts about Winter Soldier? Well, Captain America the Winter Soldier is the movie that, that apparently I hate, because I only gave it a 7 out of 10. Um, <laughs> that's, that was that basically pretty the, hateful. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that was the fallout from my, from my, um, from my initial review. Uh, I think if I gave Civil War like 10 out of 10, people would be like, oh, you only thought it was okay because that's clearly how numbers work. But <laughs> Captain America the Winter Soldier is a slight improvement on the first Avenger. I think it's got a very, very good first half. Once the scale of what's happening and uh, exactly who the villains are and stuff is revealed about halfway through, I think it loses so much of what it was building up towards. And I think that uh, the identity of the Winter Soldier and everything revolving around Captain America's past um, is a bit weak. But the action superb. It has probably the best hand-to-hand um, combat sequences of any film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm. Chris Evans is superb. I like Black Widow's um, role in the film. Great cast. I think it, it does have some terrific set pieces. The music by Henry Jackman is one of the best scores in the MCU. Um, the, the musical theme at Taking a Stand, which plays during the credits before the first pre credit sequence, is just a phenomenal track, and I love it. Um, and I think it's a it's a very strong film. Um, and although I do think it is like in the lower half of the MCU rankings, in my opinion, but I still think it's really good. Wow. Okay. Well, um, I think it's the best Marvel movie that's ever been made. <laughs> <laughs> what? Really oh, I spat tea all over my laptop. <laughs> no, I, I seriously do. I seriously do. I love it. Like um, I mentioned, like back when it came out, I mentioned in my review on my channel that. Um, I, I went in, like, this is the movie that kind of made me a Captain America fan. I wasn't really mm. a Captain America fan before this, but this made me a Captain America fan. I just love so much about it. I love that, like, it's got all the great action, like you mentioned, but it's also got times where it's not afraid to actually slow the pace down and actually take their time to develop some, like, actual characterization for the characters, which is, yeah, something that seems to be becoming more and more rare in uh, cinema these days. But, like, specifically... Trying to talk Specifically... (laughs) That's right. I I can't talk either, so I I can't really laugh at you. (laughs) Uh, It's... I'm I'm speaking specifically about that... uh, The scene where he goes in to see... Um, Agent Carter from the first movie but now she's an old woman and he's Mm -hmm. talking to her and she's like talking all about 
you know, his personality and he's like, I'm not sure where I fit into the world and all this. And then there's the bit in the conversation where her, um, uh, what's the word for when old people lose their memories all the time? What is um, it? Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, yeah. When that kicks in and she sort of looks at him and she's like, <gasps> you're alive. And it's like 50, uh, not 50 first dates. It's like the notebook where <laughs> yeah, like yeah. the memory resets and he has to start again. And he's just got this look on his face where it's like, oh, I had it for mm-hmm. a bit. But then he's just like, I couldn't let, yeah, I couldn't leave my girl when I were a dance, that sort of thing. And I was like, I just love that it takes the time to develop those things as well as the action. And I love like all the political thriller stuff. Like that's really stuff that I love the most. And Mm. I think after seeing this, what resonated with me the most about this movie is that it really, at least until Age of Ultron came along, it felt like it actually made a significant change in the Marvel Universe and it changed the lay of the land. And I love that because that's the way these movies should be. Each one should be important. They should always move forward. Nobody should reset or, you know, retcon what happened before it, Age of Ultron. Mm. But <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, for me, it's just all around. I just loved it. <laughs> yeah, because well, it came out at pretty much the perfect time because after the Avengers, the world fell in love with the MCU. And then we got Iron Man 3 and then Thor The Dark World, which I think are really good movies. But it was basically more of the same. You've got more Iron Man, you've got more Thor in, in these universes that you've become comfortable with. Then you get Captain America the Winter Soldier, which was one of the lowest grossing film like it was it was a sequel to one of the lowest grossing of phase one, and then yeah. it completely changes the setting, it completely changes the genre. This is a political thriller set in the present day, whereas the last Captain America film was a um action adventure film set in the nineteen forties. It completely changed the game. It said it said we're not gonna do more of the same like Thor the Dark World or Iron Man 3. We're gonna do our own thing and evolve the story and even change genres. And I think genre hopping is one thing that's made the MCU work so well. Like Guardians of the Galaxy is a space opera. Ant Man is a heist film and Doctor Strange is gonna be maybe an action horror film depending on what direction they go in it. You can't mm. just have one tone and one film throughout a universe you need to somehow make it cohesive but if you do it the same every time you're gonna lose an audience it's it is gonna stagnate and i think the winter soldier was demonstrative of marvel's ability to really change things up when necessary and to do it smartly and effectively absolutely yeah i totally agree Mm -hmm. Well, should we jump into non-spoilers? I mean, full spoiler time (laughs) yes yes spoiler time oh wait we should Um, probably give it a rating first shouldn't we Oh, okay. Um, I still stand by my 7 out of 10. Um, that may, that maybe could be selling the film short in many people's eyes, because I, I know that this is lots of people's favourite movies, or at least right up there in terms of their rankings. I think it's really good. It just does a few things in the second half and it, uh, that I think really do weaken the direction that it should have been going in. And I okay. think that it didn't develop the characters as well as it could have done, particularly Falcon, who is a lot of fun, but they set him up to go in an interesting direction and then they just leave him hanging there. Um, mm. But they, okay. we'll, we'll talk about it more in the spoiler stuff, yeah, we'll but talk about don't misunderstand spoiler. me. I do like this film a lot and I think I respect it for taking its time and having those moments. Like There's a scene when Black Widow and Captain America are just driving to the next location and they're talking and flirting and they're getting to know each other outside of the confines of a battlefield. And I think that is mm-hmm. something that more blockbusters really do need to replicate to build atmosphere as well as to develop the characters. Mm-hmm. So, right, yeah, cool. 7 out of 10. Yeah, well, um, I'd actually give it a 10 out of 10. <laughs> oh, controversy and, for me. Well, because it's good, <laughs> but like the reason I give it 10 out of 10 is because like, this is why I'm interested to see... like. Uh, the weaknesses that you saw later on because like when I think about like uh, what do I feel could have been fixed or done better I'm at a loss to kind of think of anything so Mm. like for that reason I'd say well I have to give it a 10 out of 10 because I can't look at anything and go that should have been different or this should have been different all right maybe the Nick Fury death fake out because that's been done spoilers Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no. Nah, people, people have seen the film. I think yeah, we'll get okay. away with that. <laughs> let's, He's let's on go for the spoils. poster. All right, so I'll give it a nine out of ten for the Nick Fury death fake out. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> but yeah, all right. Spoilers, spoilers. <laughs> mm. um, yes, spoiler time. Nick Fury is not dead. Oh, you beat me to it. Grr. <laughs> uh. Well, um, just to get the ball rolling. <laughs> okay. 
I think, um, man, I got all these notes here. I'm trying to figure out which one to start with. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Should we talk about Captain America himself and how yes. awesome he is? Yes, let's talk about that. <laughs> thanks. Good save, thanks. <laughs> yeah, he he is uh, in the title of the movie. That's right. Well, it's mm. it's the proper venue for um, it's a proper venue for them to do Civil War in his movie series than anyone else's because, like as you said, it focuses more on the thriller stuff while different other franchises focus on other things. Mm. But yeah, I I love in this the the sort of inner conflict between that he's like this old school soldier, but he's in this new world that mm. like he's. He's gone from like fighting the Nazis in World War Two, where it was a very sort of black and white decision, where he knows that these guys are evil, you know, we got to stop them. But now he's in this world where good and evil is all kind of blurred around in that gray area, and he's like struggling to try to fit in with that. And I, I think he really encapsulates that very good because I actually have noticed I've spoken to a lot of veterans, and like there's there is a very distinct difference between like a World War Two veteran and a Vietnam veteran, you know, they have very different ways of looking at the world because, you know, one, that war was very black and white and the Vietnam one, nothing was black and white. And even they look at even their own government as an enemy in a way because of what they put them through and fighting an unjust war. So I really liked seeing that sort of, that whole thing put together in this inner struggle with Cap trying to find his way in modern society. Mm. But yeah, I, I think that um, they introduced that concept of him being a man out of time in a funny way. Like he's got that list which he shows early on, which um, it changes the list yeah. changes depending on what country you're watching the film in. That's um, right. I, yeah. I, Did you I, notice I've got, any got, funny ones for Britain in there? Um, I can't remember which version that mine is. I think. Um, I think we did get the American version because um, Steve Jobs does appear in the version that I watched. And I think that's the American list, like Steve Jobs in brackets Apple. Um, but there are other ones like um, Rocky in brackets Rocky Two question mark. Um, <laughs> Sean Connery is in one list. World Cup final nineteen sixty six. Um, the Beatles moon landing, and this is my favourite Berlin Wall brackets up plus down. <laughs> <laughs> in one version, there's Thai food. Um, That's good. Old- Old boy, two thousand and two World Cup, Star Wars slash Trek, Nirvana, yeah, I saw that. Brackets Star Wars band. slash Trek. <laughs> it, it's it's a really funny way um, to like make things different for for the different territories. Like for example, in in Disney Pixar's Inside Out, the sport that um, the dad is thinking of in his mind when he's in a whole other world and his wife's trying to talk to him, it changes depending on what country you watch it in. In America, it's ice hockey. Um, whereas in the UK, it's football, it's soccer. Wow. Uh, which is just a, a little thing. Um, it's just a nice little detail. Mm. Yeah. But uh, they introduced that in a, in a funny way, but then they really do hit, hit home the point that um, in this age of espionage, where it's very much like Skyfall, where they talk about how someone can do so much damage just behind a laptop screen than soldiers can do like in the field for years and years with hundreds of bullets, um, and how warfare has changed in, in the 70 years that um, Captain America has been asleep in the ice. And I think that, and it's I think that commentary, isn't it? Yeah, it is a drone commentary, much like I in the sky, which I reviewed last week on the movie mania podcast. And you can now check that out. That's um, right. but, <laughs> but, um, it's in the time what, code. So people can skip straight to it. So. Yeah. But what, what disappoints me about the winter soldier movie is that when it's revealed who the bad guys are, that it's basically Hydra again, who have infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D. and they've been behind all of this stuff for the past few decades, it takes that idea that um, warfare and allegiance is very complicated and there's so much grey area and basically says, nope, they are literally Nazis. It goes back (laughs) to the black and white dynamic. And I think... Obviously, a few years later, we've now got Donald Trump potentially being a president. So, yeah, there is such a thing as pure evil in politics. Um, <laughs> but we, we, didn't, we didn't know that in 2014 when this film came out. So I think that it takes the idea of, of those gray areas and doing bad things for the right reasons or vice versa and how complicated it can be. And then just says, nope, Nazis. It's, it's Nazis. Literally Nazis. Uh, and that's kind of where I think the movie loses a lot of its... It, it loses a lot of the wind out of its sails, although I still do enjoy it, and I think that the um, conflict between Steve and the Winter Soldier is able to carry it for the rest of the film to mm. a certain extent. And I think 
including Fal- uh, Falcon in this movie was a stroke of genius because I think you need that lighter touch. Um, but they set him up to be a war veteran and how he's he's got counselling. And then it's never really brought up again. He gets the wings out of nowhere. Um, it, it's kind of set up. He's got a file on it. And then he gets the wings. Um, in a, it's a great entrance where he gets the wings for the first time. And he, and he picks up that guy who they kicked yeah. off the building. I think that's a terrific reveal. Actually, I, that, I that they, guy, just by the way, that guy who they drop hmm? off the building and gets captured. Like he has been in previous movies as a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. Like in hmm. Thor, when um, uh, Coulson is like talking with the megaphone. He's like, is that Iron Man when that weird Asgard giant robot thing shows down? Like the guy next to him is that dude. So he's actually mm. been in a couple of movies as a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent in the background. So anyway, sorry, yeah, like I just he, wanted to throw that in. Yeah, you're right. He's been in the background of, he was in the background of Avengers as well. Um, mm. it, it's a great way of tying things into the universe. He was in one of the Marvel one shots as well. It's a great way of connecting everything. And the guy who, um, I can't remember what his name is and I feel really bad. Uh, he, he's the one who says hail Hydra. <clears throat> he, he was in yeah. Iron Man two as the Senator. And That's unfortunately right. he passed up, he passed away a few weeks ago, unfortunately. Oh, did he? Um, oh, no. yeah, he, he did, which is very sad news. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I, I'll find his name at some point, uh, you know, cause I really want to name him. But he had a great role, a great small role as well. Well, it's interesting as well that reveal that that character is part of Hydra because in Iron Man 2, his role was he was trying to get Iron Man's technology. So mm. when they reveal that he's Hydra, you're like, oh, so that's why he wanted his technology so badly because he wanted it for Hydra. But mm. I, I take your point. Like, you actually do make a good point about um, that it's it sets up this whole thing of, like, the, the grey area between good and bad, but then it kind of throws that away when he's like, no, they're Hydra. Because, yeah, you get me mm. thinking, like, perhaps it might have been more interesting if instead of actually being Hydra, like, the people who wanted to do this helicarrier thing were just a faction of S.H.I.E.L.D. who mm. were going too far. Yeah, and then when Hydra um, But when maybe Hydra that would have been starts... too difficult for audiences or something. They'd be like, wait, who's the bad guy? So, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. possibly. But you make a yeah, good but, point. But towards the end, when Hydra starts to take over um, the helicarriers and, and everything, and then they, they have that Mexican standoff... Uh, like, it's very clear that there is a divide. There is the Hydra mm. agents and there are the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. There is a very clear black and white dynamic. That's right. And yeah. I think that that There's, is kind of... like it, it doesn't ruin the movie for me. I just think I just saw it more as disappointing. Yeah, that's right. There's never like a Deadpool moment where he's about to kill a guy and then he's like, Oh, hi, Bob. <laughs> I didn't know you were Hydra. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been terrific. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Bob. I'm going to have to kill you now. <laughs> Um, okay, the actor was uh, was Gary Shandling. Yeah, um, he, Gary Shandling. yeah, he passed away um, on March twenty fourth, um, and he he was a great stand up comedian. Told he was a very nice guy, but he he was really good in Iron Man two as well. It's just rest a in slimy peace, Gary center. Shandling. Also, yeah, rest he, in peace, Prince. Also, yeah, rest, rest in, in pe- peace, China from the WWE. So much yeah. death. <laughs> oh yeah, that today's been one hell of a week, hasn't it? Well, we welcome to a... the sadness podcast, everyone, where we talk about death and slavery and all that wonderful stuff. <laughs> and of course, you've got World War Three to look forward to. <laughs> yes, that's right. Starting over Pokemon. <laughs> Thought you enjoyed oh, Pokemon? Yeah. Well, no, it's going to lead to World War Three. <laughs> that's our mission <laughs> to suck the joy out of everything. <laughs> uh, w- welcome to the Movie Mania podcast. Um, <laughs> We also had um, Victoria Wood die this year, who's um, a great BBC comedian. She died at 62. This has been a terrible week. <laughs> wow. But anyway, Winter Soldier, it's fun and we're fighting Nazis. And there's a yeah. really cool scene where the Winter Soldier kicks somebody into, into a propeller and it's really gruesome. Yeah, that is pretty cool. You know what <laughs> I thought was funny as well? Like on the, uh, uh, you know how S.H.I.E.L.D. has like the World Security Council that Robert Redford talks to? Yes. One of the members of the World Security Council is Mr. Lau from The Dark Knight. <laughs> Remember that really? guy who's like, I'm good with calculations. He's actually on the World <laughs> Council in S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, one of the squealers. And, yeah, the squealer. That's right. He's there. And also, um, the guy who played KG Beast in Batman v Superman, who gets blown up in that with the flamethrower uh, by Batman... He's actually in this as well as one of the Hydra guys who's in the elevator who tries to take down 
um, Cap. So he has this mm. weird. There's these weird crossovers between dimensions, <laughs> mm. <laughs> between different DC franchises and Marvel franchises. Just found that pretty funny. <laughs> uh, it's all connected. Yeah, I love that bit yeah. in the elevator too, where like, oh um, yes, that burns. entire escape sequence. Yeah. Oh, that was fantastic. That whole, just yeah. I, see, I love like actual fight choreography like that because you know we were talking about the Bourne movies or the new Bourne movie coming up a while ago. Mm. It's like one of the things the Bourne movies did that I've spoken about before is that it sort of brought in the whole shaky cam thing to show the ferocity of the fight, but it worked worked with the Bourne movies. But then over time, it just became a way to like lazily shoot a fight scene because the camera's yeah. shaking around so much you don't have to choreograph anything. That's why Winter mm. Soldier's so great. Like Especially like when I was uh, scoring the fight in one of my videos, going through each move, I was like, wow, they must have practiced this a lot of times to get it right, and it looks so good. <laughs> and what's amazing is that Anthony and Joe Russo, this is their first Marvel film, but there's nothing prior to this film in their filmography or TV shows that would even indicate that they have these action chops. Like, they've done Arrested Development and Community. There's there's nothing, like, action-wise in, in this, in their filmography. But they hit it out of the park, that elevator sequence. And then he leaps out of the window, lands on his shield, and then he takes the bike, and he takes down that Quinjet, like, single-handedly with the shield, yeah. which is... A superb sequence. I would study that at, like if I was an editing film student because that is edited to perfection. The music's great, and then um, we have that sequence when he's fighting the Winter Soldier on the highway, and then um, there's he, he's got the knife and he starts flipping the knife in his hand. And the editing yeah. in, in this is superb. It got nominated at the Academy Awards for Best Visual Effects, but this should have been like a Best Editing Award and a win, not just a nomination. This is a phenomenally well edited film. Yeah, it really is. Like, I'm not usually one that notices shots because that's usually your forte because you're the real professional. <laughs> but there was a really <laughs> cool. Wish. There was a really cool um, shot where, like, after that whole scene with Nick Fury in the car where they're trying to bust in. And which is also a really cool action sequence. Oh, that chase. Oh, it's so it, it's, good, isn't it? It's one of the few times <laughs> you see Nick Fury actually do action. Because in Avengers, he just fired like one rocket launcher shot. Yeah. Which which was cool. But here he's got like a minigun in the car. Yeah, I think he shot he shot a few bullets at a car every now and then. But like, this was great. And it, they mm. even like mixed in like humor where he's, it's like, Propulsion systems is offline. What's not offline? Air conditioning is fully functional. <laughs> like cool <laughs> stuff like that. But yeah. I, I love it. It gets to that point in the fight where he's taken out all all the Hydra. He's like driving off, and he just thinks he's got away. And mm-hmm. then the Winter Soldier shows up. But the way they reveal the Winter Soldier is like the front windscreen has been like all cracked from all the bullets that's been shot at it. Mm. And it's sort of like uh, as the camera focuses, he kind of like appears through the cracks in the glass, just sort of standing there in the road. And I was like, "Ooh, that's a good shot." Mm. <laughs> yeah, and the. I'll go all artsy fartsy and professional again, but the sound mixing in this film is just incredible. Oh, yes. Like, everything revolving around the shield is great because it, like, vibranium in these films has its own unique sound. Yeah. And, and when and, like, the winter soldier. It's different when he's, like, blocking a hit or if he's getting shot. The sound is different, mm-hmm. yeah. Like, when he's blocking from the, the minigun on the highway and it's making those. It's making those unique bullet sounds. And then when the Winter Soldier just punches it and it makes that echo. That gong it's just, kind of sound, yeah. It's just a brilliant sound. And, um, and the Winter these... Soldier's arm itself has all those, mm. like, yeah, like, just, just, it shows how much sound can really affect. Like, when he grabs him with that arm, you're like, ooh, that thing's dangerous. And it mm. makes that tightening sound when he's got him by the throat. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. And the, and the um, like the background music when they're having that fight w- w- um, just before he gets unmasked and it starts to build and build and get higher and then the mask rips off and there's silence. It's it's such a phenomenal sequence and it's one of those things. That, like, I know I gave it a seven out of ten, but that is a ten out of ten fight sequence. It's so it wonderfully really done and put together. It is more. It's probably one of the best Phase 2 action sequences, and I think this is actually one of the weaker Phase 2 movies. It's just It shows just how great the action shops of um, Anthony and Joe Russo are, and apparently the action set piece they've got in Civil War at the airport is even better, and I, I won't believe it until I see it. Mm. Oh, I can't wait to see Civil War. It's only a few mm. days away here. Thursday, Thursday, Ooh. midnight. 
Yeah, I hashtag know. Team Iron Man. It's uh, two days. Yeah, I think is it two days? Mm. Something like that. Yeah, but um, <laughs> oh, and the, and the fight with um, him and Crossbow is it Crossbones at the beginning when they're on the tanker and yep. it's that big guy and he's he's finally giving him a challenge. Oh yeah, that guy. Um, that wasn't Crossbones. I think that was. Uh, Can't remember who it was. He, he was playing a character. I don't know his name. I'm not really a Marvel fan, but uh, the guy who played him was an MMA fighter. And since oh, you, you can, can tell by the way he's kicking and punching, you're like, yeah, he's this guy's knows what he's doing. <laughs> and what I love what I love about Chris Evans in this sequence is that because he's really glad that he's got a good challenge, and he he drops the shield, and it just becomes fisticuffs. It's Queen, Queensbury rules. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. Um, it, <laughs> it becomes like a gentle. <laughs> it becomes like a gentleman fight, but. Chris, that, that could have gone so wrong in terms of how Chris Evans portrayed it because he could have come across as really smug or really arrogant, which is not Steve Rogers. Yeah. But he plays it in such a way that you get the sense that he really appreciates the challenge, but not in a obnoxious way. And I think it's little moments like that that really show how Chris Evans has really come into his own because everyone talks about Robert Downey Jr. and the MCU and how he's really holding it together. Over the course of the Captain America trilogy, we've seen that shift. We still love Robert Downey Jr., but Chris Evans is really, it, he's truly a match for him in a much more understated way. Mm. 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 Yeah, and that's that's one of the things in this is you get to see, like, like part of the reason why, like, uh, when we covered the first movie a couple of weeks back, like, a lot of that is the scientist is like, I'm picking you because of who you are on the inside. And you see a lot of that in Winter Soldier as well, that he's just a really good person. And I think mm-hmm. that's why the conflict in Civil War is going to be really good, because he's got, mm. like, such a tie and a bond with Bucky, but at the same time, Bucky's not totally in control of what he's doing, and he's blowing up stuff all the time. <laughs> mm. I, I think that um, the Winter Soldier conflict is, do- as a as a singular piece of entertainment... Out of context, I think it's done really well in the film. But when, because it's a sequel to the first Avenger, it feels like it's being held back by that, like those weak origins. Because I don't really feel the relationship between Steve and Bucky in the first Avenger. I feel mm. it would be like... I was racking my brain over what kind of metaphor or comparison to go with, and I think I found one. Okay. In Star <laughs> Wars A New Hope, it would be like if the sequel was dedicated to Luke Skywalker having to save his best friend Wedge. It would be like that if they made the sequel about that. (laughs) And I don't, as much as this movie tries, as great as Sebastian Stan is and how great Chris Evans is and how how hard they try, the setup just isn't there. And I don't Mm. want to hold the Winter Soldier account for that. I've got to hold the First Avenger account for that. But it is one of the potential pitfalls you can get when you are making a cinematic universe because if your foundations aren't there then when you try to build upon them later it just shows how weak they were mm, that's true i mean they do have that bit bit of foreshadowing when uh, captain america's walking through the uh, exhibition in the museum and mm. it's like here's bucky barnes remember that and, guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, th- and thankfully they had the flashback but i think it needed a little bit more of that yeah but i i do remember in my cinema people did sort of gasp when they saw him, and mm. I was like, oh, so I guess people do remember who that guy was. Yeah, oddly <laughs> enough. Yeah. I think, um, you want to talk about Black Widow? Cause yes, do it. i got a couple things to say about her. I find it interesting, because like, looking at, like, over the different movies that she's been in, because the first time we saw her, she was in an Iron Man movie, where Iron Man was flirting with her the entire time. Mm-hmm. Then after that, <laughs> she was in... She was in this where she's flirting with Captain America all the time. And then after that, no, then before that, she was in Avengers where it's kind of hinted that her and Hawkeye have something going on. And then after Widow Soldier, we see that she's now with Hulk. Could they just not decide if they wanted to give her a love interest or with who? Or were they just kind of doing it like, oh, no, this is her character. She's always kind of flirting with someone in order to get part of her job done. What do you reckon? To be, to be fair... If, for, hypothetically speaking, if Scarlett Johansson was part of the Movie Mania podcast, mm-hmm. who would she flirt with the most? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, all, all I'll say is that that's how I want to die. Because, like, between the legs of Scarlett Johansson, she, like, kills me. Uh, which is her, like, well, most common fighting Widow, technique. So, you know, that's exactly. kind of <laughs> Exactly. That's, like, that's my perfect movie death. It'd be um, like the James but, Bond fake funeral where they'd be like, 
Well, at least he died on the job. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking seriously, I think that um, the only one where she's really had the actual roman- romantic attraction is with Bruce Banner in Age yeah. of Ultron. I think with Iron Man in Iron Man 2, she's clearly flirting to get um, under Tony's skin. Uh, yeah, that was bad phrasing. Um, he, she's doing it to try and learn more about him to find out if he's a good recruit for the Avengers. That's her goal, and because she's working for Nick Fury, so the flirting is part of um, a a long con. Whereas yeah. with um, in Avengers with Hawkeye, you get the sense it's more camaraderie. Like yeah. maybe there is something there, but they're professional about it. And, and we I find get out the same. He is married, and she she obviously knew he was married the whole time. Mm. And I get think the... of it, she doesn't really flirt with Captain America in this because she's always trying to set him up with someone else. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. I think that she, they do feel like work colleagues and people. They respect each other too much to date. Mm. Like, like they are soldiers first and foremost. They are trying to. They're working as heroes. They're. I'm sure there's obviously some attraction there on a physical level, but in terms of them being compatible relationship-wise, I think both of them know that they're not compatible with each other. Mm. I think it's done. It's it's a very it's very maturely done, and I'm so glad that they haven't really set her up with multiple romantic partners throughout this. Because this, yeah, as the only like female constant in this in this franchise, uh, that yeah, would have been Scarlet really Rich really bad. Will change that now, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she's she's going to be with Vision. I'm guessing. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you're there's... right. Well, she is single they... now because Hulk's over on Asgard. So whether they keep her single or try to pair her up with someone else, let's hope they keep her single. Mm. I'll be interested in knowing um, in knowing where they take her character in future films. But we've also got um, uh, Emily Van Camp as Agent 13 or Sharon Carter, who gets nothing to do in this film other than be a walking, talking reference to the source material. Well, apparently she's supposed to be the granddaughter or the great-granddaughter of Agent Carter. Yeah. So that's kind of why Black Widow is trying to set them up, because she's like, well, you can't date her because she's an old woman now, but you can date her granddaughter. It's kind of the same thing, which is kind of creepy, but whatever. (laughs) I have several concerns. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Also considering that that he's like a 90-year-old I know that Hollywood does have a history with um, with age gaps in relationships, but this is not a good solution. (laughs) Cap, you were born in the twenties. You're old enough to literally be her great great grandfather. <laughs> kind of. You may look very young, but you're not. But you're like Edward Cullen. But he has perfect teeth, so it makes it okay. <laughs> How many teeth will he have after Civil War though? Will will Sharon Carter still take him back? <laughs> if Twilight has taught us anything, it's that pedophilia doesn't exist as long as you look younger than you actually are. Mm, Thanks, words Twilight. to live You've by. once again shown us the way. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you said once again shown us the way. <laughs> like, well, the that's first a whole other time. discussion about Twilight. We could bag on that forever, but... <laughs> Come back next week <laughs> where we talk the moral quandaries of Twilight. <laughs> well, oh, I my goodness. With, with Black Widow, though, I found it interesting is um, we get to see her taser wrist gauntlets, which is a weapon that she has in the comics, which mm-hmm. we haven't really, like, she had them in Avengers, but unless you know to look for them, and if you blinked, you might have missed it. There's only one shot in Avengers where she tasers one of the aliens in the necks and seemingly takes it mm. out. So it's, like, in this, it's more prominent that when they're on the boat, she ignites the gauntlets and tasers a few guys, and you can sort of see it. But I found that that's kind of a thing with Marvel. They there are a few instances where they sort of gloss over someone's powers or someone's weapons mm. or someone's abilities. Like in um, like Herb with the Gauntlets and then in Age of Ultron, Vision, a big thing yeah. of his is he can phase, phase through stuff. He can walk through walls and do things like that. They never really show he has that power, but if you mm. watch like the fight scene at the end, he does sort of shove his arm through a couple of um, the Ultron bots. Mm. Well, there's a, there's a deleted scene in Age of Ultron where he first emerges from the casket. He has a full-on fight with Thor. And really? through that fight, he discovers his powers. Um, oh. And so if you get the Blu-ray, or I think you might be able to find it on, de- on, uh, on YouTube, actually, the deleted scenes where he has an entire fight with Thor in Avengers Mansion, uh, in Avengers Tower. And mm. it's, um, it's not fully rendered. There's some unfinished CGI, but you can basically see what it was trying to go for. 
um, which That's is interesting. Bit interesting. Yeah, but obviously, as we know, so much was cut out of that movie. So, oh, yeah, yeah. But um, can we let, but, let's talk a little bit about Falcon? Well, just one more thing about Black sure, Widow, sure. and then we'll move on. It's the um, it, the moment where it's the highway fight again. It's such a good sequence where she's trying to fight the Winter Soldier, and mm. it just shows how powerful of an opponent he is. Because we've seen Black Widow just effortlessly take down people over like three movies, yeah. And then she really meets her match, and Scarlett Johansson really sells it when she's hiding behind the car and she gets shot. And one of the things that differentiates the Winter Soldier from other films in the MCU is that these are bullets. These aren't laser blasts. These aren't aliens. These are. This isn't lightning. These are bullets that can take down our heroes if they get a well placed shot in. Mm. And it really grounds the story and the, the and how she keeps on using her gadgets on um, the Winter Soldier and just tries to incapacitate him, and it's just not working. And I think it's a great moment for um, when Steve comes in, and it's a great moment for Black Widow. It's a, just a great sequence and so well structured to show just how powerful the Winter Soldier can be. Mm. And actually, on that, going back to your point before about the sound design, I noticed that like uh, when he's fighting Captain America, uh, like there's a bit where he'll like shoot, and it sort of grazes through Cap's side, or he'll get like a big hit on him, and the sound kind of makes this weird. Because you know how there's that theme for Winter Soldier, that weird kind of thing. Voice of an angel. <laughs> but when, uh, like, when he shoots and a bullet grazes past Captain America and he sort of gets hurt, it makes this weird kind of screaming, squealing sound, like mm. this as you've been hit. <laughs> I can't Turns out that the bullets were full of angry gerbils. <laughs> but if, if you watch the fight scene, you listen. Like that happens a few times. Like if you, if Cap or someone else gets injured during the fight it makes that sound it's kind of like a ringing mm. in your ears if you've been injured yeah. so again really cool sound design mm. yeah but um wow. yeah i was gonna say but with the uh, with falcon i yeah let's talk about that because i liked i liked the the bond between him and captain america i do wonder yeah. though why they made that bond the way it did considering this is the same movie that he's reuniting with his old friend Bucky so I was like eh, if you got two friends that are kind of like his best mates that kind of overlap no um, I get what you mean but I think what really makes it work is maybe not on a screenplay level but it's when they get in front of the cameras and Anthony Mackie is just a he's just such a personality he's hmm. He's infinitely watchable. He's a born star in this film. In this film, he does a great job, and you feel the chemistry. And he's also just he he needs to be that grounded friend who Captain America can come to and know that you can trust him because you've got these webs yeah. of deceit. You've got this. You've got uh, everything's been cast into doubt because of what gets revealed by Toby Jones' computer face halfway through the film, and you yeah. need that friendly face to help out in the second act in the second half, as well as to just get some kick-ass sequences in there. I, I think right, that yeah. it works in, in its own context, but I, I do get what you mean. It's another example of maybe they should have expanded the movie by a couple more minutes to just give... Um, to maybe actually draw parallels between Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I don't know. I, th I think it could have been mm. done. Yeah, or maybe make it that Falcon is a bit more opposed to him like going after Bucky sort of thing, or, mm. you know... Because he does yeah, kind of say to him, he's at one point he does kind of say to him, like, look, he was your friend, but he's not anymore. You know, mm. you can't expect that there's certain things you just can't come back from. But Cap's like, no, he's my friend. So it'll be interesting yeah. to see how that plays out in Civil War. Yeah, definitely. I, I concur. <laughs> so um, I think all that's really left to talk about is, um, oh, we've not mentioned Robert Redford. Who yeah. um, I think... I was he, upset that they initially... killed him. He was a good villain. They could have just locked him in prison because he doesn't have superpowers, but Marvel insists on killing all the villains for some reason. Yeah. I, I thought he would just be like a walking, talking like uh, reference to the 70s thrillers that he used to do. Yeah. Like, um, what's the bit? Like, Three Days three days of Condor or something, uh, mm. which was like a big 70s um, espionage film, uh, like political thriller. Um, and I think oh, you, you bring him in and you just think, oh, he's just going to be like a, a walking punchline to that. But no, he, he comes across as um, a really, uh, he comes across as a, as a strong human villain, though I was expecting him to unmask and be the Red Skull at some point. 
Yeah, I was expecting that too, actually. But mm. I, I did like the uh, the dynamic uh, between him and Nick Fury, that they're so alike, but he's mm. taken that extra step that Nick Fury hasn't been willing to take so far. Yeah. And uh, it's the whole thing of like sacrificing your freedom in, ex- in exchange for your security. And the, the talking head on the screen has that whole thing with Hydra of like, we tried to take people's freedoms away in the Second World War, but we, pin- we figured out that people will fight for them. But if we get them scared enough, they'll surrender them willingly, which I yeah. think feeds in perfectly into Civil War and why, like if, if um, Iron Man is like, well, we need to control, you know, we need to put systems in place to control and Captain America will be like, well, we've been there and we've done that with S.H.I.E.L.D. It didn't work very well. I don't want yeah. to go down that road again because you can't trust them sort of thing. So I, but, I like but it's, that it it's, sets up that. It's very ballsy because it, it's it's a very relevant theme because like, you do have yeah. a, a topic right now where there are where there is so much surveillance. You have to sacrifice your privacy to feel safe. Mm. And because the MCU is essentially... I know we've had a lot of um, uh, mature discussions on this podcast so far you know world war three <laughs> slavery but yeah. this is basically a huge analog for 9 11 because you get the avengers yeah. and there's a huge event in new york like the, the event in new york obviously 9 11 and then you have um iron man 3 with post-traumatic stress disorder like about everything happening uh, emotionally from that but then you have captain america the winter soldier which is about a the grander plan about how after a big event happening in New York, people are prone to fear. They're prone to anger and and outrage very quickly. And they are willing to sacrifice their freedoms in order to feel safe. And Mm. then you have Captain America show up as basically this walking, talking analog for heroism and everything that's good and true. And he's opposing that it's, it's rare that you see a movie take a very solid stance on something. So it's immediately relevant. Yeah, it's true. And it's a very, very big issue that almost no one is talking about. There's a documentary uh, on Netflix. I think it's called Rise of the Drones or or something like that. But it Mm. it basically just sort of breaks down about, you know, we hear about all these drone strikes or all this or that hitting different terrorists or whatever. And it really breaks down, you know, how exactly did this system come about? What exactly is it? And it basically what it is is uh, it's... (laughs) Like again, this is the politi- this is the political stuff coming in, but it relates back to the movie, so it's all good. Mm. But um, this whole sort of drone strike thing, what's unique about it is that it's outside the normal bounds of military. It's outside the normal bounds of law. It's basically a militarized extension of um, the actual government itself. Where like Obama has been one of the ones who's really sort of built this, where he can give the personal order to take out these people and it doesn't have to go through any kind of rules and he can basically reach out anywhere in the world and hit anyone he wants without any kind of trial or anything like that. And Mm. one of the guys who was uh, sort of spoke out against this is he said, the problem with this is, he says, we might have a list of 100 names that are targets that we take out. He goes, but the problem is, by the time we get to the end of that list of 100 names, we've now got a list of another 200 names, a lot of which are made up of enemies that we made taking out the first 100. <laughs> He's like, yeah. and it just keeps going. And he said, so we've built a, a massive hammer and that hammer is now going to be always looking for a nail somewhere. And if there isn't a nail, it might just invent one sort of thing. So, And that ties in directly with all of these Hydra helicarrier, helicarriers that just calculate who's a threat and make this preemptive strike. And Captain America and Fury have that discussion where Fury's like, we can neutralize threats before they happen. And Captain's like, well, doesn't the punishment come after the crime? Don't you see a problem in that? So you're right. Yeah, it is very, very topical. And it's something that does need saying, to be, have more attention. Who says, that, to. who says that comic book movies can't be about stuff? Exactly. <laughs> mm. Exactly. That's right. But yeah, yeah I, I recommend anyone uh, check that out on Netflix. It's a really interesting documentary. And What was um, that called again? I think it was called Rise of the Drones. Rise of the Drones. Okay. Yeah. I'll write that down. But, um, okay, let me, I've got a couple of different things written down here. I like the bit where when uh, Captain America and uh, Black Widow, uh, they're sort of on the run and they walk into this computer store and <laughs> <laughs> the bearded sort of hippie, you know, uh, hipster kind of guy shows up and he's like, hey, do you need some help and all this sort of stuff? And they're like, no, we're good. And he looks at Captain America and he's like, 
you know, you think he's going to say, oh, I recognize you. But he's like, <laughs> I have the exact same glasses. <laughs> and Black Widow's like, wow, you're practically twins. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah. Captain America's got these like Clark Kent sort of glasses on <laughs> Yeah Like there's really good bits like that um, mm. I like the bit like uh, the part where the council like sort of fires Robert Redford basically And like mm. he's like really upset about it And they're like you know we're going to override you blah 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 And the guy's like if you want to say something snappy now's the time And I was like ooh that's a sick burn I'm going to remember that <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. it's good if you say that to someone they can't come back with the combat no matter how funny it is because you've already mm. said well hey if you want to say something snappy now's the time so i'm gonna <laughs> store that one in the memory banks <laughs> it's, like, it's like in deadpool when he's talking to negasonic teenage warhead and he's like what's it gonna be yeah. snarky comeback or silence <laughs> she's like you really bagged me into a corner here <laughs> oh <laughs> i like the bit yeah. where uh where black widow when she's on the ship and um um, Captain America comes busting through the window with the MMA guy and she's there hacking in the computer and he's like, what are you doing? And she goes, oh, I'm backing up the hard drive. It's a good habit to get into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it's just so full of wit as well. It's a really, it's a really good dialogue driven story. Um, and yeah, you do need more of this in blockbusters. You do, you do need these moments of levity without it coming across as just pandering or, or as a parody. But it, it never, like Winter Soldier, it never feels like a parody or, or it's making fun of itself, despite the fact that it is a really entertaining, uh, crowd pleasing blockbuster. <laughs> absolutely. That's absolutely oh, but, right. oh, How great is um, Samuel L. Jackson when he, he one ups um, Robert Redford at the end, says, You need to keep both eyes open. Yeah, and he takes the, off the eye patch. The I think it's one, of, scan, yeah. Yeah, it's one of the coolest moments in the film. <laughs> uh, too, too bad he's not really dead just like Groot and Agent Coulson and yeah, Loki no, no one ever dies in this do you think <sighs> Captain America yeah. will die in Civil War? Um, I've, I've said my theory I think he's going to die and then the events of Thor Ragnarok will be about Thor um, wanting to go back into the afterlife to rescue him yep. and the afterlife is full of incredibly powerful beasts so he's like we need a Hulk and then they bring Hulk in, and there's going to be massive consequences for bringing back somebody from the dead, like there should be. I don't mind mm-hmm. them bringing them back, but it's got to be at a cost. You need some sort of personal or like big sacrifice, otherwise you just basically yeah. eliminate death from the universe, like Doctor Who. That's, where a, the fin- that's a good point. It's okay to bring someone back from the dead if you show it comes at a cost, yeah. Yeah, it's like in in the latest um, series of Doctor Who, which may sound which may sound like a tangent, but I've got an axe to grind. <laughs> is that the final episode basically was like, oh, we we can now bring everybody back in the world who we ever want to without consequence, as long as at some point they go back and and die. Like, but there's there's no time limit on it. They can basically do whatever they want. So essentially, the ending of the last series eliminated death from the Doctor Who universe. Wow. Very much like um, Star Trek Into Darkness. I was going to say, Trek- does it involve yes. magic blood? <laughs> uh, no, it involves a white room full of people who are very ineffectual. But yeah, Star Trek Into Dumbness uh, so really, <laughs> really wrote that universe into a corner, didn't it? Yes. Yeah, I can't wait to see what uh, what dumb excuse they come up for. Come up for why well, they can't do any of that. I guess they'll just probably forget about it. But I, 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 I think like Simon your idea Pickers about directly addressed that. Uh, he says, yeah, we're basically just going to ignore that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what he said. I think everyone's happy do? to forget about Star Trek Into Darkness, so that should work fine. <laughs> It'll be yeah, like and Batman's admit it, no killing rule in you the next movie. You forgot about it. Everyone will just forget about it. Um, mm. But I, I like your idea, though, about um, Thor and Hulk having to go in the afterlife to get Hulk back, because that could also tie into the teaser in Age of Ultron that Captain America could kind of lift Thor's hammer. Mm. You know, there could be a payoff for that somehow if you're wielding Thor's yeah. hammer at some point. I like it. Good. Yeah. But there is precedent for that in the comics, Thor and Captain America fighting demons in Valhalla. That there is precedent for that in the comics. Mm. And I think it is one of those sequences where um the um, where the Cap has lifted Thor's hammer. And I thought in Age of Ultron he was gonna like fake that he couldn't lift it up because he didn't want to hurt Thor's feelings. And then later on in the heat of battle he'd just forget about it and pass Thor the hammer. Like yeah, he was faking the entire time. He just didn't want to hurt. He just didn't want to upset Thor. Yeah, <laughs> but then they appended that with with the vision, which was a great twist. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. 
I, I like the bit um, where Zoloff, the, the guy on the computer screen, mm-hmm. when uh, he's explaining all of Hydra's plan to, to Cap and Black Widow, and you're like, well, he's doing the classic comic book villain thing where he makes a mistake of explaining the whole plan to everyone. But then they do this twist where she's like, oh, wait a minute, there's a rocket incoming that's going to blow us all up. And he's like, yeah, sorry, I was actually just stalling to keep you here. And I was like, ooh, mm-hmm. I love that. So like yeah, they saw like, the cliche and they sidestepped it. <laughs> yeah, it's job. like syndrome in The Incredibles. You got me monologuing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. Mm. the The only other note I've got is um, there's that bit where where Captain America and um, Black Widow they have that conversation in the car where she's like, you know, was that your first kiss since 1945? And he's like, no, <laughs> that wasn't my first kiss from 1945. <laughs> but um, <laughs> But then when mm. they get to, just before they go down into the Zoloft base, they're going through the old S.H.I.E.L.D. base, and one of the pictures on the wall is um, Agent Carter, young Agent Carter, mm. and Black Widow's like, who's that? And he kind of doesn't answer, and he just goes through the door. I thought it would have been good there if when she says, who's that, he could have said, my first kiss, because they were just talking <laughs> about kisses. That would have been a nice tie-in. <laughs> yeah, possibly, yeah. <laughs> but I think that's pretty much all the notes I've got for it. Mm. Well, I think the only thing left to talk about now is um, the post credit stuff. Um, I think the one teasing Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch is awesome. I think that's a great teaser. And then you see Scarlet yeah. Witch just, like, crush the two boxes together. Yeah. Um, and then you've got the one with um, Bucky in the Smithsonian, which I think is a phenomenally phenomenally lame post credit scene. Uh, I remember seeing this at mm. the midnight screening the day it came out. And I went with like two or three of my friends and I saw it at a midnight screening because I was going to be doing a um, a live review of it uh, when I did student news back at university. I was the film critic there. Um, mm-hmm. And it was like, yeah, I'm going to see this at midnight and go on TV and do my reviews like six hours later. Um, and I saw it with two or three friends. And then I was like, oh, yeah, we've got to stay behind for the credits. I've got to see what happens. And then my friends don't like me anymore because I made them sit through credits for something very, very boring. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how you lose friends folks it's like uh, my girlfriend doesn't like me for making her sit through the X-Men Days of Future Past post credit scene because she doesn't she doesn't know who, who Apocalypse is that, that yeah. means nothing to her and I made her sit through all of those names <laughs> well <laughs> see my, my friends use me as like a sort of like a, a screener for that kind of thing because like for a lot of the big movies I'll see it like opening night usually comes out as a Wednesday here, so they'll see it on the weekend. So if I go to see it again with them, they'll be like, is there an end credit scene? And I can be like, yeah, but it's not worth it. <laughs> or yeah. something like yeah. that. So that's a way around it, truly. If you have to mm. see a movie early, you can always give them advance warning. Yeah. Uh, oh, and also, I made my girlfriend sit through the credits for Guardians of the Galaxy. She doesn't know who Howard the Duck is. <laughs> she hates me even more now. Yeah, that, that end credit scene confused a lot of people, didn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. It, I'm Everyone's sure it like, was meant what? to. <laughs> What is that? How hashtag Howard for president? Yes. Oh, Howard is the next is the next Winter Soldier. <laughs> confirmed. <laughs> hashtag confirmed. Well, actually, there is one last thing we should probably talk about, which is uh, mm-hmm. the guy who plays Crossbones because he's going to be in Civil War again. Yes, he is. Now, I I do really like that actor who played Crossbones, and I do think that like there's a a bit where. Bucky, after he encounters um, Cap on the bridge, where Bucky he sort of needs to have his memory reset, and Robert Redford is like, you know, slapping him in the face, and they reset him, and he's like, ah, and all that. But um, Crossbones has a moment. There's like a quick shot of Crossbones where he's sort of looking at Winter Soldier being reset, and he's kind of got this look of horror on his face, Mm-mm. and it's this weird, uncharac- somewhat uncharacteristic moment. But I sort of interpreted that as he's like. Crossbones is looking, he's like, Ugh, that could be me, you know, that could do that mm. to me. What do you reckon? Uh, yeah, I think that Crossbones, he serves exactly the role that he should in this movie. He serves as a an alternate physical threat for Captain America mm. um, and someone, uh, and just another um, body that needs beating up extensively. Um, I, I see, I like Frank Grillo a lot, and I think he he still has a lot left to give to this role, which thankfully is back in Civil War. Uh, have you seen him in, in the Purge movies? He's yeah. in the Purge Anarchy, and he's going to be in the Purge Election Year movie. Yeah. Um, and he's bas- in those movies, he's can, can basically... I just, the- can I just say, I yeah? actually really like the Purge movies. <laughs> the, the Purge it's a guilty is- pleasure of mine. 
the purge isn't very good. The purge anarchy is one of the it's, it's one of the few sequels where you can say it is significantly better than the yeah. first. And That's I think fair. in those in those movies, Frank Grillo is essentially playing the best Punisher that we've never had. Like I, I know that we've got the Punisher in in the Daredevil Netflix series, but watch the Purge Anarchy and imagine that the Sergeant is the Punisher, and the movie becomes even better than it already was. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. He I'm looking forward the to the Purge movie. election year. Yeah, that me seems too. really good. Really, <laughs> you know, it's I'm a really, really good idea. I'm not really into horror movies all that much, but for some reason, I really like the Purge movies. But um. Mm. Yeah, going back to him as Crossbones now, because he gets hit in the face with all the glass at the end of the movie, and we see him getting wheeled away on a trolley where he's all yeah, shredded. He becomes, he becomes the Diamond Man from um, Dying of the Day. Yeah, <laughs> Diamond Face. Uh, Diamond Face. <laughs> That's his name. That's the proper name, Diamond Face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So whether he's gone through a Winter Soldier transformation to become Crossbones, or whether he's just wearing a costume that covers his face because his face is all shredded now, but either way, in the comic book storyline for Civil War, um, he is the one who assassinates Captain America at the end of it. Yes. So whether he is going to do that in this movie or whether he's the one who maybe blows up what looks like um, Black Panther's parents in the trailer or something and mm. Black Panther thinks Bucky did it or something like that, who knows? But be interesting to yeah. track what happens with him in Civil War. Wouldn't it be funny if it's if Captain America does die in Civil War? Not seen the film yet, so I can't confirm or deny or anything. Mm. Wouldn't it be funny if it was Ant Man who killed him? <laughs> like they they upend all of the expectations, and because when Ant Man's yeah. tiny, he's he's like a bullet when he punches. So if he punches someone too hard, they will die. So maybe yeah. he gets a bit too far away and just kills Captain America. <laughs> he could. <laughs> He, the potential is there. He, he can Rudd take down the Falcon like, on his first day. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't mean to. But are you okay? Can you sign my trading cards? <laughs> He's like, sorry. I'm. Ju- I'm just used to like picking locks and breaking into places. I'm not really used to I'm this beating whole up your sidekicks. war thing. <laughs> But yeah, Captain, like Ant Man, he's actually one of the most powerful ones there. When you really think about it, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing if we get Giant Man in Civil War. I, I think they might be saving Giant Man for the next solo Ant movie, Ant Man and the Wasp. Maybe, but... because if he turns into Giant Man, it's game over. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> side he's on, he's going to win. <laughs> oh yeah, he's going to be like the new option. Yeah, yeah. Well, because they got rid of now that they've gotten rid of Hulk and Thor, it's much more even. You know, mm-hmm. but because they've shown Scarlet Witch can take on Vision, so yeah, yeah it'd be interesting to see what but maybe Ant Man will take on the Spider Spider Man. There's <laughs> a um, there's a Avengers animated film. I can't remember what it's called, but it's got a, it's based off the Ultimates universe, and they do have a basically the Avengers come together, and it ends with them a fight with the Avengers versus the Hulk because they've beaten up the bad guys and their day is saved, but they can't calm the Hulk down. So the Hulk fights all of them and essentially beats the stuffing out of all of them. And Giant Man is the first one to go because he tries to hold him down. Like this giant hand tries to um, tries to pin him down. And then Hulk just jumps up and grabs him by the throat and starts strangling him. Yeah. And that, that, that's I think that, that was really clever because you could, like with him being that big and the Hulk being that strong, it could be a weakness. And I think that it's just really cleverly done i think you should watch at least that um that final fight sequence you can probably find it on youtube somewhere yeah totally <laughs> mm. all right well so there you have it guys there was winter soldier mm, and dr strange cameo kind of he was mentioned one time yeah that counts as a cameo i'm sure Benedict yeah. cumberbatch got paid for that Not. oh <laughs> he, yeah he gets he gets two percent of the profits for this film <laughs> He's still earning money from the DVD sales. It's a very, very lucrative deal. Okay, Cumberbatch, you can have 2% of all of the profits from this film, but we literally break your hands. <laughs> That'd be great. I'd love that. Excuse me. I'd like to ask you a few questions. So everyone, here are the listener questions where you guys put in questions on the Facebook and the Twitter pages, and we will answer them. Uh, Truby, do you want to start? I think there was one there specifically for you. Uh, yes, there all. Yeah, yes, there was on the Facebook page. Ben Billington, ten out of ten for your name. Um, Truby, <laughs> as an aspiring filmmaker about to graduate, any advice on how to make the next steps into the industry? 
Um, so I was in a very similar position a few years ago from you, Ben Billington. Um, and this this isn't stalkerish, I promise. I just had a quick look at um, your profile to find out you are from the UK, so I do have relevant advice. Um, so uh, there are certain Facebook pages where you can go on, like, say, production runners wanted or people wanting to get into TV. And there are certain ones that are run by very nice people for free where you can go on these pages to look for um, entry-level work. Because one mistake a lot of graduates do is that they make one or two short films for university student projects and then they make a business card that says... Uh, ben Billington, director, editor, camera operator. It's like, no, you don't just get that the moment you leave university. You have to work your way up. You have to become a runner, uh, work your way up for maybe a year or two to a third assistant director, then second assistant director first, and then you, you work your way up. Um, it's a very long and drawn out process, and there is no set formula to it. But what you need to do um, as soon as, like, ideally now, you say you're about to graduate, uh, you should go on these Facebook pages to look for entry-level positions, uh, put together a CV um, and of what you've done, and just try and just keep applying for ev- anything and everything you can that you feel like you are able to do. There are some paid job boards, uh, like My First Job in Film or Production Base or um, um, Film and TV Pro, where you can you get emails with job notifications. These, like ten percent of the time, they pull through. They may not be worth the financial investment. But what you really need to do is you need to just use your time at university to know, get to know your tutors and try and establish a relationship with them so that they may be able to recommend a few things after you graduate, so you can find work as like, as soon as you can. Um, what you may need to do is you may need to get a part-time or full-time job doing like retail or something, like, a, like, more of a mundane job, for lack of a better word, so that you can do a runner job every so often. The me- the film and TV industry is becoming more and more in- insular, where you need where people are being driven away because they are working so many hours. Like there was a news story this week where Britain's Got Talent uh, under scrutiny because they're making their runners work like seven days. Um, like 18 hour days, seven days a week with no yeah. holiday pay, not paying their travel. Um, with, like, they're basically slave labor. And it, it's Britain's Got Talent. It does not surprise me in the least. And I've heard so many horror stories in the industry of people like the Jeremy Kyle show, which is the UK equivalent of like Jerry Springer. Um, I've heard horror stories of people working 28 hour days with no breaks um, and having to drive home and like sleep for four hours and then come back and do the same thing again. It is an exploitative industry in daytime TV, and it's depressing. Um, and also, if you want to get into directing, if you do want to do that, you are going to have to make the content. The content's not going to come to you. Save some money, get some friends, make short films, submit it into festivals, enter script competitions. It's going to be a grind, but if you want to work in the industry, you've got to do it. And the first short film you do... It's going to be pants. It is. And I'm not saying that to try and deter you. It's going to be pants. But submit it anyway. You're probably not going to get in, but do it again the year after. Do it with the next festival. Just keep working at it. Establish a team of friends, regular people you, you can come to. In Manchester, where I am, I have a go-to guy for cinematography. He has a great camera equipment and great editing software. If you want to do a film... We- we go to him. I've submitted a film into a festival. I'll find out in a few weeks if it gets in. I'll invite you to the screening, Ben, and you see how it's done. Um, but enter these film, do film races where it's like 48 hours to make a film. Get a team together. You're a graduate. You're a student. You should have friends who have diverse skill sets. You put a team together. Go out there and do it because it's not going to come to you. That's really the best advice I can offer. Bandit, you got anything to add? That's really good advice. <laughs> <laughs> it is going to be a grind. It's going to be hard, but don't quit because it's hard. Because it's you've got to push through it. Because I graduated with like 30, 40 other people. Only about five or six of us are currently working. So many people gave up because it didn't work for them after a year. And it's depressing. And I know that they were talented and had the capability to do it. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a grind. But it's going to be rewarding, and you'll have some of the best experiences on your of your life working as a runner on, on shows because you get to interact with everybody. Even if it is just making tea, or if it is just holding the boom, you'll learn what people do in these smaller, lower positions. And then when you do work your way up to director or producer or third AD or whatever, you'll know what those people do. Starting from the bottom means you work your way up, and you know what these people can do. So when you are director. 
when you ask the runner to do so and so or you ask the second AD to do so and so then you'll know that they can do it and you'll know that that's their job because you've done it it's the best way to get in and you're gonna have to work your way up and it's gonna be a grind but I wish you the best of luck Ben Mm, mm. yeah really good advice man like um yeah I mean you're certainly the one qualified for that because like you actually work in the official channels like and all that sort of like the official sort of industry I can kind of relate to some of it because like I've I think I mentioned this before on the show but like I sort of grew up wanting to be a writer and all that so I did Mm. I have actually written a few books that uh which were terrible and I agree with (laughs) you when you said the first like short film you make is going to be terrible because the first thing I wrote was terrible even though we all think it's amazing when we make it. <laughs> and then we look back at it and go, oh, man, what was I thinking? That's awful. Yeah, I, I think I said it in the podcast last week. Anything you write before the age of 16, throw it out. Yeah. Because uh, it's not going to be very good. And but it's but not, you it... still need to go through that process of writing it because like, people exactly. who are afraid of failure don't start. But it's a learning curve. Everything's a learning curve. You fail your way to success. They say with yeah. a lot of success, um, like with businesses, they say you have to fail at 11 before you, the twelfth one is the one that usually works on average. So you have to be willing mm. to fail eleven times before you get to that twelfth one. But um, yeah. the only other thing I'd like to add is like being a like we're also in a time and an age where there's a lot of value to being a self starter in many mm. different fields. I think like uh, a lot of musicians are self starters. Like if no one's interested in their music, if they can't get like a record deal or anything like that, they just record it themselves and just put it out there. And if it gains traction, that's how they actually break into the business. A lot of directors do that. You know, we're seeing a lot of like independent filmmakers, you know, getting bigger deals off the basis of that. Mm. And um, yeah, so I think like that's also an option to consider just being a self-starter. You can always, if no one wants to uh, buy your stories, you can always just write them and make stupid animated versions of them on the internet. (laughs) You rewrote Star Wars. That is no small feat. Which hasn't um, led to anything yet. Well, I mean, not yet. It's led to being able to probably wants writers. (laughs) We'll see. Um, We'll see where it goes. But yeah. Um, just a bit of advice, um, just general stuff for writers as well, uh, which may apply to just general filmmakers, is that if you want to get into writing, you'll need an agent. But in order to get an agent, you need a broadcast credit. But you want an agent so you can get a broadcast credit. It's a very insular in- industry, and it's very frustrating. But what you've got to do is, if you are in a rural area, go to your local TV station and say, I want to do stuff for you. Local TV is, believe it or not, becoming bigger in the UK. You are finding a market where they do want this scripted content. They don't, they don't just want to do local documentaries or local news and local weather. They do want to try and have a platform to have content because of YouTube. Most local TV stations put their content on YouTube where it can find a bigger audience. Write stuff for your local TV or at least get a relationship with them so you can have the equipment. And also, um, you could technically write, say, an article for the Huffington Post because they accept freelance stuff. Write an article for them, and then you can go to an an agency and say, "I've done some writing for the Huffington Post," and you could get an agent. It will be a really bad agent, but you'll be on the you'll be on the on the ladder. You'll be there, and then you can work your way up. Um, recently, there's the Damien Chazelle film Whiplash, which was which was like a big Oscar contender a few years ago. It won J.K. Simmons the Oscar. And basically that the person who wrote that, he made a scene from the film. He filmed and directed a scene from Whiplash. Uh, he got J.K. Simmons on board and they made the scene, entered it into Sundance, and it won the Best Short Film Award and it got funding to make a feature-length version of that film. J.K. Simmons came back, they got Miles Teller in the cast, they made a 90-minute film based off that one scene and it's a big Oscar film, and Damien Chazelle is now established, and he's on the map. So if you do have a feature film project, make a scene from it, or make a very compressed version of it. Film it on a budget, make sure it's polished. Like, you can have a low-budget film and still have a lot of polish, it'll just take a lot of time. There's the triangle of efficiency. It's like, um, it's um, quality, cheap, and fast. You can't have all three. You, you need two. You, you need at least two. I think that's how it goes. Um, it, it makes a lot. Of, it makes a lot more sense if you've got the diagram in front of you. But yeah, make a scene and get it into festivals because, like I said, it's not going to come to you. You've got to make the content and don't just put it on YouTube straight away. It will be great for your earlier stuff so you can get that feedback. But you've got to enter it into festivals because many festivals won't accept films if you can find it on Vimeo or on YouTube because it yeah. makes it very difficult to prove your authorship. 
Is is that why you haven't uploaded your short film yet? Um, basically, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. there's a few th- like, so for I've been student things. Out. I've been looking, looking forward to seeing that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm even going to send it to you. Um, but for student right, films, cool. <laughs> you, it's it's tough to submit those into festivals because they are owned by the university technically, because oh, um, you yeah. used their resources and stuff, um, which means you don't often see student films in festivals. Um, so if you did make a student film um, and you think there's real potential there remake it without the university and then you can enter it into stuff um it's very tough and i'll i might make a video or an editorial to try and elaborate i'm hardly the most qualified person i am working on that you're, bottom you're the most the qualified industry. person here <laughs> yeah that's that, by default i am the Zack snyder i'm the only person willing but it's um, interesting because i think in many ways it's i think it's kind of semantics because like everyone everyone has like a different way of saying it but the advice is pretty much the same overall like kevin smith has said things that have like echoed stuff you're saying where uh like he said just get out there and just do stuff and you know uh cast your seed around you don't know where it's gonna sprout sort of thing because like with yeah. um that's not a dirty reference by the way <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> but kevin smith he said uh like when he was talking to his sister when he was a kid and he's like you know i want to be a director i want to be a director but i don't know how and she's like we just do it. Just pick up a camera and just do it. And he did. Exactly. He just learnt along the way. Granted, he a lot of people say he's not the greatest director, but like he made it. And like as well, William Shatner, one of his mm-hmm. like again, he's acting, but it's all still sort of the industry, and a lot of the advice overlaps. Like uh, in one of his books, where he's got all these rules, which is a really funny read. Um, one of his rules is say yes to everything. Where he's like, yeah. any opportunity that comes along, he says yes to anything because he doesn't know where it's going to lead. Like the reason he said yes to this stupid TV show that nobody had heard about called Star Trek was because even though most people wouldn't be bothered with it, is he's like, say yes to everything, take every opportunity. And William yeah. Shatner, he did a, a series of commercials in America for some some brand or whatever. And uh, it was from those commercials that he ended up getting the job to play Denny Crane. <laughs> Yeah, because the guy who was writing the that show was like, "Oh, who am I going to cast to play Danny Crane?" And then one of those commercials come on. He's like, "Oh, William Shatner." So like, yeah, just get out there and do do stuff yourself and take every opportunity you get. Yeah. There is like a fallacy in like the media world where they say, "Oh, just pick up an iPhone and make a movie." Um, but if you, like, that's a great way to sort of um, like get started, but if you want to yeah. enter it into festivals. No, because they will only accept broadcast quality looking stuff. Like there's there was True. a film called Tangerine yeah. last year, which is an independent film, very very tiny budget, and it was filmed on three iPhone five smartphones. They used the cameras from those, and people are saying, "See, you can make a movie on an iPhone and be respected." But what the filmmakers did was that they had these special massive lenses that they put on the iPhones and they used like thousands of dollars worth of editing software to change the image and make it look more polished. Yeah. So that's really cheating the system. It's yeah. like when there was that, um, I'm just going to look it up now, there was that book called Aragon um, from 2002. And it, it was written by like a 15 year old, uh, Christopher Paolini. And then um, English teachers would be like, see, a 15 year old can get a book published. You can do it too. But they don't mention that Christopher Paolini, his parents owned a book publishing company. <laughs> mm. That was essentially how that book got made. So um, although uh, one final thing, and then I promise I'll move on. Um, do not accept like slave labor like people will be like oh we'll pay you an exposure exposure is not going to pay your rent exposure is not yeah. going to feed you like obviously maybe if it's like a day or two um and you've got the time to do it if you can get a few days off um, off a retail job or whatever part-time you work work you're doing yeah, maybe do it for the experience and and to try out different projects. But if it's like, oh, two weeks, we won't pay your travel, um, but you'll get a copy of the DVD for your show reel, and you'll get. Like, don't accept those deals because you are worth more than that. You should be worth more than that. And it's it's just basically slave labor, and this industry does not need any more of that. Yeah, you know what? I agree with you with with that because I actually had. <laughs> A while back, I actually had someone uh, approaching my channel because I did a video about um, uh, We Want Wharf, which might be a new uh, Star Trek TV show. And one of the guys who actually runs the We Want Wharf sort of thing contacted me and he was like, hey, do you reckon you'd be willing to help promote the show? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I want to see more Star Trek. He's like, well, maybe if you could help sell these T-shirts and in return you'll get more exposure. And I'm like, 
What do you mean what? exposure? <laughs> I'm like, first of all, I don't <laughs> want to plug a product to my subscribers because people don't like that kind of thing. And it's probably not something I would buy anyway. But also I'm like, well, what do you mean exposure? He's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm out here in Hollywood. I'm interviewing all these different people. I can give you access. I'm like, dude, I'm well, in what? Australia. How's that help me? <laughs> I'm like, what am I going to interview guys over Skype or something? <laughs> it's like, So yeah, that I've discovered from that as well, that exposure is often a fancy way of saying <laughs> we're not mm. going to pay you. <laughs> yeah, and, and the first job application you send, it pro- probably you're not you're going to get a dear John, which I'm not sure where the term comes from, but it basically means uh, a denial. Then they're, they're, they're going to say no, we've picked somebody else. Don't get disheartened by that because like you're going to send 20 applications and only one of them will get a reply, and that reply might not even say that you got it. But just keep going at it, and the more applications you send, the more likely you'll get the job. Because the next, the the no you receive is just one more application away from being a yes. So just keep pushing at it. And if you really want to work in the industry, then just keep pushing. Mm, absolutely. Good, good chat. Okay. I'm glad we talked about this. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I get that question a lot from people. And uh, like I said, I'm not the most qualified person. I know basically how to do it. It's just doing it. <laughs> so mm. it, it is luck <laughs> of the draw. Uh, but basically, if if a movie like Batman v Superman can get a screenplay like that, yeah. you can be a writer too. <laughs> that's right. It gives me hope. That's that's kind of like Stephen King said that about writing. He's like, well, you know, to be a writer, you have to read a lot. You have to write a lot. And he goes, the good thing about the reading a lot is often you could read a book and you're like, man, this really sucks. I can do better than this. And this got published. <laughs> oh, I, I, I know. Same I keep thing on here with movies. I know I keep on saying we should move on, but this, one other thing, if you want to get into writing screenplays, read screenplays. You wouldn't write a book without having read a book. <laughs> like, uh, get one of your favorite movies, like um, Inglorious Bastards. Uh, you can buy the screenplay for that online for like eight or nine pounds on Amazon. You can go, you can go to a bookshop and buy scripts. Or you, if you're a student, you can go to a library and sometimes read scripts to Back to the Future and Tim Burton's Batman, like at my university. Read the script, Read it as you watch the movie, and then you'll just understand the language of screenplays and formatting, because formatting is a big part in writing a script. Because if you don't format your script properly, then you can, then if you give it to an agent or to a company, they'll just throw it straight in the bin if it's not been formatted properly. That does happen. There's a program called, um, Celtex. It's C E L T X, and it is free screenwriting software. There's a paid version, but you don't need it. Just download Celtex, and it does a lot of the formatting for you. Just learn formatting. If you're a Doctor Who fan, there's Doctor Who: The Shooting Scripts, which is a book which has all of the scripts from Series One, and it's got the screen directions. It's got the stuff. Um, so that's just a great way to learn the terminology. And I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. It's it's good. We we can. We should let it. We should answer it as the natural, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> Look, I was so going to say. Different... I was going to say though. You brought up screenwriting. Um, mm. I follow Max Landis quite a lot, and he gives a lot of insights into being a screenwriter in Hollywood. And I got to say, from how he describes it, it really doesn't sound very good. <laughs> no, it, it sounds it like a nightmare. And I thought I was like, man, you know, it's like I don't know. Like if if I ever if ever if anyone like in one of my wildest fantasies because I am going to start doing original stories like once I'm done with Star Wars and animating and putting them on my YouTube channel in one of my wildest fantasies if like Hollywood's like hey we want to turn that into a movie you know would you like to write the screenplay of course I would say yes because you say yes to everything according to William Shatner but <laughs> yeah. writing scripts in Hollywood based on what Max Landis said that's not like a goal that I'm actively going to seek because it sounds <laughs> terrible it sounds really rough. And it's it basically sounds like, I think, uh, I can't remember if it was him or someone else, but he said one, actually, I think it was someone else. They said one screenwriting tool is like, if you write a screenplay and you know it's perfect, you're like, everything's right, everything's perfect. Even if it is perfect, it's going to be changed because that script's going to pass be passed on to everyone else. Everyone mm-hmm. else who's investing money wants to feel like their money uh, is is invested in a safe project, so they're going to want to change stuff to make it better, even if making it better, I'm doing air quotes, is actually ruining it. So he gets his script, he gets it ready, but he doesn't send it in. He keeps that and puts it to the side. Instead, he goes back to the script and he takes out something that definitely needs to be in there and he puts in something that definitely should not be in there and he puts them in as bait so that when he hands the script along 
to the others, they'll be like, yeah, it's good, but, you know, we just need something else in here and we just need this bit taken out. And he'll be like, Mm -mm. hmm, good idea. You know, I never would have noticed that if it wasn't for your help. I'll get to work on it right now. Goes back, gets his original script, brings it back to them and they go, oh, perfect. You fixed it. And he's like, well, couldn't have done it without your help. And that's like how he tries (laughs) to preserve his script so it doesn't get ruined by that process. Doesn't always work. He says, so that's that's really idea. clever because <laughs> one great way to direct actors because you, if you're starting out in the industry you're going to be working with people on little pay or your friends who are working for free as a favor so you don't like show people that embarrassing Facebook photo. It's going to be stuff like that, and what's going to happen is that um, they'll maybe give a bad performance during one take but you don't want to say change it do this and that because you don't want to hurt their feelings or maybe they're bad at taking direction so what you do they do a bad take you approach them and then you say that was really good exactly the same again and then what they'll do in their mind they'll be like okay i've got to recreate that and inadvertently they'll do it differently and attempt to recreate it so that's a really good way of making an actor feel like they're in control and doing the right thing, but that you're actually getting something different out of them. Reverse psychology. Well, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, again, like I know we keep saying we'll move on, but <laughs> I've, I've heard another technique that directors use, and you might have seen this, is like... It's called the whip. Oh, okay. Is that what it's called? <laughs> but, that's better. You mean a literal whip? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, Not this is cool. a slavery podcast, so that works. You know, and we have said oh. that <laughs> making oh, movies is like go, slavery. Full, full circle. <laughs> but um, yeah, one another technique I've heard the directors use is when the actors are sort of rehearsing, like a scene of like experimenting. Should we do this? Should we do this? Like the the director will like throw out suggestions here and there so even if the actors aren't like yeah let's do that it kind of like subconsciously gets into their mind so it works Mm. its way into the performance so it's yeah it seems interesting that directors need to have all these psychological tools to to get under people's skin like i I heard this story about uh, when gene hackman was cast as lex luther in superman movie um i can't remember the director's name of that movie what was his name uh richard donner richard donner yeah (laughs) Well, at the time, Gene Hackman had a big mustache that he was very proud of. And Richard Donner, of course, you know, Lex Luthor doesn't have a mustache. So, like, they were having a hard time getting Gene Hackman to agree to shave his mustache. So Richard Donner's like, well, look, I'll tell you what. I'll shave my mustache if you shave yours. Yeah. So Gene Hackman is like, you do that? And he's like, yeah, okay. So he's like, all right, I'll do it. So Gene Hackman goes in, shaves his mustache. He comes out, he's like, there we go. He goes, now it's your turn. So Richard Donner's like, okay. Reaches, grabs his moustache, peels off this fake moustache. <laughs> oh and Gene Hackman is just like, dude, I'll do whatever you say. Because <laughs> he's like, just respects smart like that. <laughs> yeah, because oh, actors are not props. They are people and they need yeah. coercing. They, like, it makes them sound like puppets, but you're the director, you're the boss. You, you, they should be your puppets in a sense. They are there to serve your story and don't take any nonsense from them. They ain't got no trailer. You can take the trailer off them. <laughs> I've also heard, I've also heard, this is another story about a different director, uh, a guy who directed a lot of John Wayne movies and who actually got into a lot of fist fights with John Wayne on set. What? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, back in the day. Uh, but he actually found, because when he started directing... Uh, he was he was just naturally a really nice guy, but he found that because he's a nice guy, it's really hard to get people to do what you want. So he found it's better to build up a reputation as a real tough kind of jerk that mm. is sometimes nice. Because, see, if you have a reputation as a bad guy, but then uh, so people will take you seriously, but then when you're nice to people, they won't take advantage of your kindness and try to take liberties and stuff. But if you have a reputation of a nice guy and then you try to be tough on them, they won't take you seriously. So you can't get them to do what you want, which I guess is why a lot of Ridley directors like Ridley Scott are just total jerks. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. people do what you want if you have a reputation of being a bad guy. Then you can occasionally be a nice guy and they'll still take you seriously. <laughs> Mm. And when you are a nice guy, they'll appreciate it all the more. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> ah. hey, I think that's everything I've got to say. Yeah. It's, I, the the good thing about working in media is that you will be working from sh- uh, short job to short job on these like short term contracts, which means that you can 
use time in between jobs to work on your own personal projects and your own screenplays and stuff. So it's a good cycle of work and reward. So, mm. okay, that's really, that, that's really all. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. All right, well, moving on, our next question. We got a question here from a guy uh, whose name I don't recognize, so I think this might be the first time this person sent a question in, so that's why Ooh. I want to focus on it. This is uh, Ethan Mai said, let's say that Captain America and Iron Man MCU films remain the same, except that the actors for Captain America and Iron Man have to be changed who would you pick for each one? So the the whole MCU universe is fine, except we're recasting Captain America and Iron Man, and who would we pick for both? So to give you time to think, Trey, <laughs> Trilby. I'd say I think you said for, Trey. Uh, t- Trilby. What? <laughs> Sorry. What are you doing to me? What are you doing? It starts with the same three letters, okay? <laughs> <sighs> no, more like the first two. I know we've been recording for a while, but oh, you can't yeah. be that tired. Oh, yeah, first two. Yeah, just, that's why I didn't uh, make it as a writer. I can't spell. That's just... <laughs> hey, I can't write. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, so to answer the question, I think for... I actually think if, if Robert Downey Jr. was to be hit by a bus tomorrow and we have to recast Iron Man, I would actually go with James Franco. Because I think okay. James Franco, he can obviously do the comedy side. We know he can do the comedy side. But he's done his fair share of serious roles as well. And he is hes is one of those actors that's a little bit like the Johnny Depp that can sort of disappear into the role to a certain degree. So I think he'd actually do a really good job. I mean, granted, we'll always say Robert Downey Jr. is the Iron Man that we all know and love. But if he got hit by a bus, we have to replace him. I think James Franco would be a really great Iron Man. Captain yeah, America. And Seth, and Seth Rogen is War Machine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that'd be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be. Uh, Captain America. Yeah, that's a bit tougher. I have heard that that dude from The Office was supposed to be Captain America at one point. Which dude so, from The Office? I don't know the main character. I haven't watched it in such a long time, but I'm I'm stumped the, with the US Captain series. America. Uh, Steve Carell. No, no, the um. <laughs> Yeah, he's from the US series, but he's like, uh, is it Jim? His character's name, Jim, in the US series. He ends I'm up... Wikipedia as hard, Wikipedia-ing as hard as I can. Um, um, he was Jim, you know. He got off with the secretary. He ended up marrying her. So I never watched um, the American Office. Okay, yeah. uh, Jim, Jim, uh, John Krasinski. That's it. Yeah, he actually was in line to be Captain America when they were looking to cast the part. Oh, okay. So I guess maybe him. He did play a soldier just recently in um, that Michael Bay movie that wasn't terrible. 13 Hours. <laughs> That's right. See, so mm. useful having you here. You know all this stuff. <laughs> Wikipedia, it's my friend. It will really? never leave me or judge me. See, I'm scared to like Google stuff during the show because I know it will interfere with the Skype, but it, maybe it won't. That's the thing about Wikipedia. uses so little bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, oh, he's know. married to Emily Blunt. Oh, is he? Why, man? He got he got lucky, didn't he? Wow, what a champ! <laughs> Good uh, for him. Oh, and and Stanley Tucci is his brother-in-law. Really? Uh, it's, it's Wikipedia. Wikipedia never lies. Wow, that's amazing. No, no he he can't be Captain America because he's he's his father is Polish American and his mother is Irish American. Okay. <laughs> nope, nope, can't do it. Nope, it's not happening. Don't care if we've got a Brit to play Superman. <laughs> Don't care. Chris, see, Chris Evans, he is American. He's he's all American. Yeah, he's yeah. born in Boston. <laughs> I don't know who who do you think would would work as an Iron Man or a Captain America? See, for Captain America, I just can't really. I can't really think of anybody anybody that hero, heroic and good willed like Chris yeah. Evans. But Chris Evans but, is just so perfect; it's hard to imagine anyone else. Yeah. But then again, before he was cast as Captain America, I would never have seen Chris Evans in that role because of like Human Torch and because yeah. uh, he was he was so I was so used to him playing like bros and and like frat house dudes and everything. So I, I could be surprised, but for Tony Stark, I I am seeing maybe it's a cop out because he's his dad, Dominic Cooper. I think um, he'd do pretty well there. Um, okay. Because um, I think he does have that natural swagger. I think he, he could do really well. Um, see, it's so tough because these two actors have just thoroughly cemented themselves into public consciousness. It's like saying, yeah. oh, who would you want to play Captain Jack Sparrow? It's like, yeah. regardless of your thoughts on Johnny Depp, he is a, that performance is a, is an institution. 
Yeah, that's that's why but I have it, to imagine they get hit by a bus, and that's the only reason we're recasting. I don't want to imagine that. I don't, want, <laughs> I don't imagine getting hit by the bus. Uh, but mind no, you, if, it if, is, if, Captain, if Captain America and Iron Man both got wiped out by the same bus, how ironic would that be? <laughs> the same bus driven by Paul Rudd as Ant Man. Hey, have you have you seen that clip where um, where uh, uh, Chris Evans is like uh, Robert Downey Jr. is eating a donut? Chris yes, Evans walks and, up, he's like, and Elizabeth Olsen's the last? in the background. Yes, <laughs> oh they're doing God. the Batman v Superman. What did I say would happen if you eat the last donut? Something like raining down hellfire. I think a storm is coming. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Oh, and she's um, like, <laughs> and it gets corpse. Um, I'm thinking maybe someone like Carl Urban for Tony Stark. Ooh, actually, that's a good he, one. He's got the hair. He's got he the can't facial fuzz. America, because he's New Zealander. But oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, he'd be good, wouldn't he? Yeah, I think yeah, he. He's a bit bulkier than than Tony than Robert Downey Jr., um, but I think he, he could do it. I mean, he's he's been in the genre films before, like Dread, Star Trek, because he's he's um, he's McCoy, um, and he's played Aoma in the Return of the King. He's one of the the uh, writers of Rohan. I think he's he's got the chops for it. I think he is he's very good. He is one of the standouts in the Star Trek franchise because he he grabs. Owns it. He does bring that heart to the to the series. I think he's really good in those films, and I think that he he would make a very good Tony Stark. I think. Yeah. Actually, but you as for up Captain, Star Trek, what about yeah. Chris Pine as Captain America? Uh, Chris Pine, a very fitting yeah. name because all of his performances are so wooden. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like he's Red Letter Media's joke about that. You're wondering if he wants to climb Chris's pine tree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was the um in the Star Trek Into Dumbness trailer where where um Khan or not Khan is like I am better at what everything including acting. <laughs> like, I don't think like Chris Pine he's not a bad actor but he's kind of like The Rock in which he plays a better parody of an yeah. action star than he plays an action star. Like he's he's um he's the prince in the Into the Woods musical and he's hysterically funny. He's so funny and good in that film. Whereas when you get him in like Jack Ryan, whatever that film was, then he's just, he's not very good. I think he's a good supporting um, actor in, in a movie like Unstoppable where he, where Denzel Washington really is the star there. And, and he, mm. he's pretty good in the finest hours where he's playing a much more reserved character. But in terms of stoic leading man, I just never see it. Mm. Like he's really funny in Horrible Bosses too. Like yeah. he is clearly having a ball in that role. Actually, you know what? But, you you just mentioned The Rock. He's from the WWE. What about John well, as Cena Captain America. as Captain America? Oh, I thought you were going to say The Rock as Captain America. I oh, like, no. imagine he, that he Civil War, that. like um, Tony. That what do you think cool, of that though. registration act? Well, Steve, I think it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> I think it punches like <laughs> in the face. Because the Rock, he's he's thought he's fought earthquakes and he's he's going to yeah. fight Jumanji. He can take Iron Man. He doesn't even need the shield. You know, I would actually be okay with John Cena as Captain America, though. Like, I know you might not know who that is because you're not really into. Dark oh yeah, I, I mainly know him from films like Trainwreck. And have you seen Daddy's Home? Uh no. <laughs> he makes the greatest I saw him cameo. In the Marine. In I saw him in that. Uh, I mean, that was years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, that was ages ago. So <laughs> I don't watch I that he, movies. He plays the dad in the, in those Fred movies. You know, the YouTube the YouTuber Fred. Yeah, yeah. Like he he's I think he's been in all of those films, and he plays the dad. And he, wow. he's he's funny. He's like the only funny thing in those films. Yeah, yeah. Well, he has like yeah, he has done some acting before, and he's he's pretty good. You know, I mean, of course, he's not. He's a wrestler first and an actor second, but he's he's pretty good. I don't know cuz like Ooh. a lot of wrestling fans he's like one of the most hated wrestlers in WWE. Um but at the moment he's sort of away and there's this other guy Roman Reigns who's now the most hated wrestler in the WWE. So it might <laughs> okay. actually be a time if if Chris Evans got hit with the bus you could bring John Cena over and he might actually be all right. Well um this is slightly um unrelated but um the other day at work, I, um, I was driving around some people on, on this um, project I'm doing. Um, I won't name the guy because um, 
like you know gives, gives the courtesy but he said that he he's working as a stunt supervisor he does like car stunts and he does like action films and stuff and we were talking and he says he's done the bond films and he's done the captain america films and i said oh i'm really looking forward to civil war next week and he's like yeah it should be good i've seen um, some versions of the film and it's really surreal looking at the action sequences because i know that I'm the stuntman in those shots so I'm watching it and I'm thinking oh Captain America has killed me there there he's killed my friend Phil there he kills me, he kills me again he's, he's killing me there and then I said he plays all the henchmen a- does he? yeah if you write an autobiography uh, you should call it the man who got killed by Captain America a dozen times yeah. and then there was a pause in the conversation and he said yeah I'm, I'm stealing that title <laughs> so, but I guess the, I thought you could thought just it was call funny. it like the man of a thousand deaths or something like that. Or... <laughs> yeah, all of them by Captain America yeah. in, in like a colon at the bottom. <laughs> but I just thought that was just a, while we're talking about Captain America, I just thought yeah. it, it was it was funny. <laughs> I saw um I saw this picture of uh, uh back when Dark Knight Rises was being made. There was Bane, and Bane's got his body double, of course. You know who has the shaved head and is in the exact same clothes, standing next to. Um, God, why am I so bad with names all the time? Um, oh, who played Bane? It's on the tip of um, Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy, God, what is wrong with me? Why can't I, I lost it as well? I, for some reason, I was thinking of um, the like guy who played Bane in the Batman and Robin film. What <laughs> I think it was like a wrestler or something. Wow, that's really going back. <laughs> oh, God, that, that yeah, was I... um, that was a mental brain fart. Robert <laughs> Swenson. Um, plays him in, uh, um, Good in Batman work, and Robin. Good work, Robert Swenson. You did a great job at the way was you'd it, go. It, it, like oh that. my goodness! I just I just looked at him on Wikipedia, and he like died a month after Batman and Robin came out. God, the film wasn't that bad. Oh my god! <laughs> Blimey! See that that movie is lethal. There you go. It's it is. It is so bad. It literally killed Bane. <laughs> Like, you can imagine, I was, I was um, saying with uh, with Tom Hardy, I, I saw a picture of like him with his stunt double, and they're dressed identical. They look the same, and the subtitle says, "When this movie is over, you have my permission to die." <laughs> <laughs> so I remember when um, when The Rock was um, becoming a big name in the films, and he was in it, there was there was. Um, pictures of him on set for Furious 7 and he was massive he had, like he he looked like he was he was smuggling watermelons in his arms his arms were that big yeah and they there were side by side pictures of the rock in his wrestling days and the rock now and the caption said only the rock could make the rock look like a pussy <laughs> and it's true like there was some there was a story where he uh, on the set of Furious 7 where he's dressed in a policeman's uniform and these people were robbing a shop across the road from where they were filming. So he got into character and was like, police, don't move. And he chased after them. Wow. And when the rock is chasing after you, you might as well have a literal boulder coming towards you. Because yeah. they just bolted and dropped all of the stuff. And he like basically like did a real life act of heroism. Wow. Yeah. So th- yeah, that's why that's... the rock should play Captain America. He's a real hero. Really is. <laughs> Either that or Wesley Snipes, I don't know. That's like when uh, Liam Neeson like went to like take on a gang of thugs in New York City <laughs> to defend really? his dog. Yeah, he was out for his jog. He was jogging around New York City, and there's a uh, a bunch of like gang members who were like throwing rocks at a stray dog that was like cornered in this uh, wire sort of fence. Must have been like you know a baseball field or something like that. They have those wire fences, so they're like you know attacking this dog and throwing rocks at it. And he runs in and he tells them to like f off or I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I will and, like, look he was for you. Ready I will find down. you because he's like and six I five, I think. You. Liam Neeson. Or oh, something. he is a he's, he's a, a big tall dude. gentleman. And um, yeah, so <laughs> so he's ready to throw down with these three guys, but like this other woman who was across the street who had already called the cops before he came along. So like <laughs> the story that I heard the way it was told. <laughs> It was like, and that's when the police showed up and saved those three criminals' life. Because <laughs> Liam Neeson would have killed them. <laughs> oh, he would. And then he, like, Without comforted mercy. the dog or something until, like, you know, the pound or something came to get it. <laughs> Aww. Why are movie stars so much better than the rest of us? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. They are literally gods to us. <laughs> well, um... I think it's been, yeah, it's been about two and a half hours. So, mm. yeah, you want to, should we wrap it up? 
Um, should we do one more lightning round question? All right. Because I think we've only done two. Sure. Oh, yeah, that's true. We've only done two. All right. Go for it. It just took so long answering them, so we'll just do a, a quick lightning round one. Uh, let me just take a look. Here's, here's one. Okay. Um, yeah, a quick lightning round one. Um, which horror slash monster movie do you think you would most likely survive in and how? That's from Seb PD. Mm-hmm. So, like, so which, if you were a horror protagonist or a character in a horror film, which film do you think you would most likely survive? Well, after you described to me, um, like a month or so ago, what the Leprechaun movies are, I think <laughs> yes. I'd probably have the best shot at surviving that guy. Because isn't he just afraid of a four-leaf clover? He is, yeah. yeah. And, and if you, and if you throw can... a shoe at him, he, he's got to shine it. That's right, that's right. So he'd be the easiest one to beat. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Either that yeah. or I reckon uh, any zombie apocalypse I reckon will be easy enough to survive because there's been so many zombie movies and like TV shows out there. I think the entire population would know exactly what to do when a zombie outbreak happens. So you'd, mm. I think we'd all survive that because we've been psychologically trained in zombie warfare for so long. Yeah, <laughs> I've 100% completed Dead Rising. I've I've trained for this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, but... what do you reckon? I'm thinking... And I talked about it earlier, so it's on my mind. It follows because because they establish the rules, and if you follow those rules, it can't be particularly difficult. Like as long as as long as you're looking out, look, look, look keep one eye over your shoulder every so often. If you get far enough, like and and who who knows, maybe you could pass it on to as many people as you could. You just have a really good night out in Amsterdam or something, and then you, you could be I, I safe know, for a while. Though. But isn't it like? Ooh, see, I don't know what if you're unlucky in love, like you'd you'd never get a good night's sleep because you wouldn't know how close it is to the house or what have you. That's mm. why. I, that's I think why that, you get. The, that's that why it, I get the nearest train, like the nearest plane to like Australia or something. Yeah, and then it just has to walk across the entire ocean floor all the way. <laughs> and exactly. Even, and have you have you seen the Australian outback? That thing is long. <laughs> There's a lot of space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think, um, oh, I don't know. I reckon that, I think one of the worst things for me is like not knowing, you know, and with mm. that, you would never know like how close it is. Maybe you could put a GPS on it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but if it's following the exact same logic as it does in the movie, because yeah. it says, oh, when we're introduced to it, the guy who's giving us all of the expositions, he says it can take the form of anybody, whatever it, do, whatever it can do to get close to you. But the forms it takes are of like really horrifying things that would cause me to run the hell away if I ever saw it. <laughs> uh, it. It never takes the form of, say, a friend. It never takes the form of a relative to get close to you. No, it's always like a seven foot tall, pale skinned guy with his eyes gouged out or th- this woman who is perpetually urinating these are literally forms that it takes and it follows and these are forms that i would easily be able to identify and run the hell away actually that's true yeah exactly and it, it always <laughs> walks although to be fair in the movie sometimes it seems to like run off screen or teleport or, or sometimes just stand still entirely like i said it follows proceeds to set up these rules and then just breaks them with reckless abandon <laughs> It is frustrating to watch because it's like, oh, I want to like this, but not one proofreader did yeah. not one single member of the cast like speak up at one moment and just say, it you doesn't know make sense, doesn't bro. Work, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I literally just said this. Shut up. And I'm making it follows. Yeah, and it's true. You could just like fly to Singapore and visit a lady of the night and then go, well, it's mm. your problem now and then just fly home again. Um, in... They establish um, in It Follows that if it kills the person who currently has this STD, this sexually transmitted demon, um, if it kills them, then it moves back onto you. So you have to oh, like no. set up a line of people. Oh. So basically, you get really cheap flight to Australia, do something there, go to back to Europe, do something there, then go to America. Just basically, just have a really good time of having a world tour. Wow. And then... <laughs> Basically, that should who, buy you at least a couple of months. You'd have a difficult time of like getting someone who's willing to like be in that line. Oh, no, you don't have to tell them. You don't have to tell them. You just tell them afterwards. 
No, no, don't even, don't even tell them. But then, but then they could get killed, and then it comes after you again. So you have to hey, tell them so that they the move question, on to someone else. The question by Seb PD was not which horror movie do you have the most moral quandary over. It is which one do you think you'd survive? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess if you go to a lady of the night, you know she's gonna, you know, have another client coming in right after you, and then it's his problem. Yes. So actually, that's the best oh. option. Yeah. Yeah, it is, and and as right, long as you do you it in like, good. <laughs> yeah, as long as you do it in a country like far, far away from where you currently are. So let's yeah. say Greece, I don't know. Um, then, then yeah, you, you have time, and as long as you're looking over your shoulder every so often, because it, it walks towards you and it's always wearing white, and yes, yeah, so, yeah I, I think I could survive that. Yeah, yeah, good answer. Yeah, yeah that's the way to go. <laughs> Or just go Jaws. Just stay on land all the time. <laughs> yeah, just it's never just go It's just the, the shark. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for yes, listening thank to this you. episode of the Movie Mania podcast where we talked about Winter Soldier. Join us next week where we will be talking about... Isn't it a movie preview? Yeah, I think it was summer movie previews. Because even though um, Trey's already seen Civil War, I will have seen it by then. It doesn't Same. come out in all countries until the week after, so we're going to wait until everybody's seen it, and then we can talk mm-hmm. about it freely. So, yep, next week will be summer movie previews, where we'll talk about some of the upcoming ones. Uh, we'll, able to, uh, we'll be able to brush <laughs> we'll up. Be able to, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> we'll be able to brush up on some homework assignments, clean up any questions we've missed. Should be a good episode. Look forward to it. So, thanks for listening, and Trilby, where can the people find you? Well, the people can find me online on my website, www.trilby.com. That's T-R-I-L-B-E-E. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Trilby Reviews. You can follow me on uh, Facebook at Mr. Tardis Reviews. Mr. Tardis Reviews is my TV stuff. I've just done a video on the new Doctor Who companion announcement. Um, and there's also my movie channel, Trilby Reviews. And yeah, uh, you can also find me on the Movie Mania podcast, which is an awful lot of fun to record, even though it's gone midnight here. But I do it because it's fun, and I love you guys. So, um, oh, the, I've also got a, I've also got a Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash Trilby. You could throw a couple of quid in there, and that would be absolutely splendiferous. That's Get right. it? I'm British. <laughs> make up words I, I should see about seeing if we can get some like audible sponsorship make some money I want some money you want some money I'm a, I want that dollar yeah money's good money's good yeah alright <laughs> you can't pay Sorry. your rent on exposure bandit that's right that's right we don't do this for the exposure <laughs> 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 and people can find me on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter as Bandit Incorporated. See you next week, our movie maniacs. <laughs>